Hello, dear misfits. It's time for another endless and sleepless night of scary horror stories. This night, we'll spend three hours talking about unexplained cryptid sightings that turned out to be true. Thank you for your support, and we do hope that you'll enjoy tonight's compilation. And now... Story time! I was out hunting with my dog and two friends in the deep woods when we got separated. I called out for them, but there was no answer. I was completely lost and alone in the dense forest. As I searched for my friends, I heard a strange noise behind me. I turned around, but there was nothing there. I continued walking, but the noise followed me. Suddenly, a large creature tackled me to the ground. It was a Bigfoot, with fur covering its entire body and glowing eyes that seemed to pierce through me. It snarled and growled, baring its teeth as it tried to attack me. I was terrified and struggled to get away, but the Bigfoot was too strong. Just as it was about to strike, I heard the sound of my friends calling out my name. The Bigfoot fled at the sound of their voices, and I managed to escape. I told my friends what had happened, but they didn't believe me. They thought I had just gotten lost and was hallucinating. But I knew what I had seen was real, and it would haunt me for the rest of my life. I live outside of Kenora, Ontario, Canada in a rural area. My house is about 100 meters from a small stream that splits the small wooded lot in half. I was there one day and all of a sudden I felt cold and uncomfortable like I was being watched. I also became increasingly paranoid that somebody or something was out there with me. I decided to head in. The sun was setting and dusk would be upon me soon. I started walking towards my house. As I approached the edge of the woods I turned around and briefly saw a large creature about 80 yards from me standing across the stream. It then proceeded to take a step toward me. I panicked. I ran out of those woods in about 5 seconds. It's the most I've ever been scared and the most adrenaline that I've ever felt run through me. In the brief period of time that I saw this thing, I could tell that it was pale white, tall, and humanoid. It's believed by First Nations people that a Wendigo will call you for help like a human in order to lure people toward it. I have heard what sounds like a little girl calling for help out in those woods. It's still terrifying to even think about this. About a year later, after a heavy snowfall, I again heard the calls of a girl coming from the woods. I looked out the window but didn't see anything. That night, the sounds continued off and on. I live alone but there is a couple that lives about a kilometer from me. A few days later I had the opportunity to talk to the couple. I asked them if they had heard the sounds. They both looked at me with wide eyes. They seemed so relieved that they were not imagining the sounds. The husband told me that he saw a tall pale white humanoid walking through the woods behind their house while he was chopping wood. I asked him what he thought it was. He said that he wasn't sure but he remembered that his father would talk about Wendigos when he was a boy. I have not seen the humanoid again, and I'm not really sure what this thing is. When I was younger I used to go to a place called Desolation Wilderness near Camino, California. It was the perfect place for camping and fishing realizing that it had been a few years since my last trip. I talked to a friend of mine to go camping and fishing. We managed to talk another friend into coming with us and then we were off. We arrived around 1 PM and decided to hike upstream from a place called Wright's Lake and then when we found a good spot we would set up camp. After walking for a couple hours a ranger found us hiking and told us that we actually weren't even technically in desolation wilderness yet and that we needed to keep hiking for a bit longer. I started tearing down the camp but I guess the other two guys were not as enthusiastic about the trip as I was. They left for Placerville to find a hotel room. When they left I hiked up a bit farther but I started to worry about the amount of time I had to find a place and set up my camp before dark. 
As I hiked I tried to remember the ranger's instructions but I ended up getting lost. Finally, I found a granite cliff with a stream that had a beautiful pool of water and was right on the tree line. I thought it was perfect so I set up camp and started fishing. When the sun had set and the sky was dark I decided to go to sleep. Cozy in my sleeping bag I started to drift off but then I heard something growl outside my tent. I grabbed the .45 compact handgun from its case and looked down through the screen on the front of the tent. From where I was standing I could only see a dark figure that looked around four and a half feet tall standing near the trees. Thinking that it was a bear I started yelling hoping that I would scare it away. It didn't move. I then fired a shot at a dead tree nearby. That startled it and it ran back into the forest. But to my surprise, it didn't go very far. I climbed back into my tent. Then I heard crashing sounds. It was the sound of rocks falling off the cliff and hitting the pool below and the rocks around it. This was unnerving. I climbed out of my tent a few times but I couldn't see anything even though the moon was bright and the white granite rocks reflected its paleness. Crashing rocks hit every few minutes until around 2 in the morning. Then it stopped. But I heard something rustling just outside my tent. I yelled at it and tried to scare it off. But instead of scaring it I heard a very deep growling sound in return. At this point, I didn't want to wait until it got too close. So I got out of my tent and looked around. Nothing. I decided to shoot the tree again to see if the creature would react then run back into the forest again just like the first time. But it stopped again. As I listened to the sounds of his moving I realized that it was running on two feet. This was not a bear. I didn't want to go back into my tent. I grabbed my sleeping bag and moved over to the middle of the big slab of white granite nearby. I felt safer and knew the forest was further away from me. But I could still hear the noises of rocks crashing. I prayed the sun would come up soon. At about 4.30 in the morning, I was awoken from my light sleep. I looked back at the trees but didn't see anything. So I looked back over at my tent. There it was standing at the side of my tent. I panicked and picked up my gun and shot the side of the creature but it didn't flinch. Then, with giant steps, it walked toward me. I shot at it. I wasn't sure if a .45 would even stop such a beast. But it was my only hope. After the second shot rang out it was off into the trees. Shaking like a leaf I sat down clutching my gun. I waited for hours until the light started to appear in the sky. I broke camp and headed back down to Wright's Lake. That was the last time I saw the creature. That was also the last time I went to the desolation wilderness and I will never go back. It was July 2004, three of my friends and I were out in a field, just having a good time, messing around. That's when we heard some noises off in a field, a couple hundred yards away. We didn't think too much of it. A little while later, we kept hearing the noises getting louder. We could also hear trees breaking and things like that. We tried to ignore it, but we soon found out that ignoring those sounds was a bad idea. We saw a creature that was seven to eight feet tall coming toward us. The creature stood like a human and acted as a human would but it looked like a dog or a wolf. We were completely surprised. We had no idea what was going on. We ran back to our cars as fast as we could and drove away. Maybe five years ago. One night, I was at a friend's house out in the country, in Vesper, Wisconsin, when my friend's car turned in and came rushing up the driveway. The car came to a halt and two of my other friends jumped out. They explained that they had seen something they just couldn't describe. I asked them if they got a good look at whatever had them so shook up. They looked at each other and said yes, they said they were driving through the country, on their way to join us, and were driving past a farm when they noticed something in the ditch. The friend who was driving said he flashed his brights to get a better look and whatever it was raised up and ran across the road on all fours. It looked like it could walk on two legs if it wanted to, they both said. They also said it looked like it was half dog, half man. 
or maybe half dog and half monkey. They couldn't explain how the creature looked any better than that. They just kept trying to compare it to other animals. They said they were about 20 yards from it, the brights were on, and they got a good look at it. Well, that's the story. I'll never forget how stricken their faces were with panic and fear. I don't think they were lying. It was a cold and cloudy winter evening, and I had just woke up from a nice little power nap. I was tired as usual after every power nap, so I slowly got up and went to the kitchen to get something to eat. I got some food, heated it up and went to go sit down and watch some YouTube. I sat down and found a video of urban legends on my homepage. I was interested so I clicked on it and watched it. It showed the usual goat man, and moth man but one urban legend caught my eye. A urban legend called the orange eyes, I was intrigued and watched it. The video creator said that it was a Bigfoot type creature, it was tall and had glowing orange eyes. But what I was really surprised about was it was a urban legend from my state, so after I heard that information I searched up where it's supposedly at. And found that it was only a 15 minute drive from me, so like any other adventurous human I hit up my friend and asked if he wanted to come with me and go look for it. He told me that he doesn't believe in that stuff and it was a wasp of time, but I begged him and finally after a couple of minutes he agreed. I was really excited I got dressed and packed some flashlights because it was almost 9. After I was done packing up supplies I got in my car and had to pick my friend up. When I got there he didn't look too excited and said that he was tired. He got in the car and we were on our way, I told him the details and what the thing looked like and he said that, there's no way that thing is real. I told him that it will be fun and that there's probably nothing out there, we got to the road that would take up straight to the area we could get out at to be closer to the forest entrance. While driving down the road I couldn't help shake the feeling of being watched, but I tried to not notice the feeling and kept heading down to the entrance. We got to the entrance and I handed my buddy a flashlight because it was pitch black outside, I told him if he was ready and he said that he was good. So we start the nightmarish journey into the forest of the orange eyes. We walked for a good hour or so with nothing really happening, my buddy said that he was tired and wanted to go back home but I told him let's stay for two more hours. He agreed and we continued walking, I couldn't shake off the feeling again of being watched. I told my friend if he felt the same way and he said yeah ever since we turned onto the road that headed down here I felt like I was being watched. We both were on edge now as we continued forward, not too long after the feeling of being watched we hear to our right something being snapped like if someone or something stepped on a branch. We both jumped at the sound of it and pointed our flashlights over in the direction of the noise, but to our relief it was just a little deer. We joked around with each other about who jumped more at the sound, we did this for a minute or two. We were in the middle of having a little argument when we heard heavy breathing coming from my left. We stopped arguing and listened closely to see if it was what we heard. We heard the heavy breathing like we thought we did, I didn't want to shine my light over there so I tried to see if I could see anything. Thinking back to it I wished I didn't look because what I saw would haunt me for the rest of my life. What I saw standing there behind a tree was 10 foot creature standing there with one of its eyes peering around the tree. And what shook me down to the core was that its eyes were orangish red color. At this point I wanted to pass out from fear but I stopped that from happening. I looked at my buddy and I could tell that he saw it too, I told him that we need to get out of here now before it's too late. We both agreed that we would take off at a dead sprint back to the car. I told him on three we will go I started to count but I couldn't even get to two when felt a warm breath hit the back of my neck, at that point I screamed run. We kicked it into six gear and ran as fast as we could. As we were running I heard the tree moving and felt the ground shaking. My lungs were burning from the thin cold air. We ran for what felt like hours until we saw the car. I reached into my pocket for my car key and with one swift movement unlocked the car, opened the door, and turned the car on. I put the car in reverse so fast I felt like I could have been a stuntman for a racing movie. 
I hit the gas flung the car around like a action movie. I put the car in drive and floored it down the road never looking back once. Once we felt like we were a good distance away to ease up a bit. I asked my buddy if he was okay and he said he was fine. All I did on the drive home was think about how close the creature was to me for me to feel its breath. I dropped my buddy off and told him to be safe and take care. When I got home I took everything off took a shower and went to bed. The next morning was good I felt like the day before was just a bad dream. But I realized really soon, that it was real, because the backpack that I had used to carry my stuff had a big slash in it probably from the thing or a tree branch. From when we were running away, I called my friend to check if he was alright and continued my day after. By now I've kinda gotten over it and my friend doesn't think of it anymore. From that experience I don't want to go to a forest to hike or camp anymore. I hope you take something from this and learn to not be stupid like me and go out to a forest at night. I worked as a park ranger for a time in the Black Hills of South Dakota. My goal after graduating college with a degree in conservation was to work somewhere in the Rockies. But a job working the Blackout Wilderness came up and I took it. The Blackout Wilderness is home to Blackout Peak. Formerly Harney Peak. And is the highest point of South Dakota. Fortunately it's a very scenic and decently easy route to the top. That most hikers can manage. Unfortunately that meant a lot of tourists. In coupled with the fact that we were in Custer State Park which is home to a couple of large bison herds that are easily spotted from the road. The tourists flocked there in droves. It wasn't that I hated the tourists. Wilderness areas need tourists for income. It was just that I had expected to work more with nature and less with people. Twice a week I was scheduled to patrol the watchtower at the top of the mountain. It was about 7 miles round trip and I had to hike in. I loved it. Getting up before the weekend warrior crowd. And hiking in as the sun rose. I lasted two years at that job before I found another one close by. Less tourists and more time in nature sounded perfect to me. I didn't have to warn families about the dangers of trying to pet bison anymore. I would be working for the Black Hills National Forest. Not quite the start of the Rockies yet but I was moving in that direction. I was thrilled to be working there. I loved to be out in nature and seeing all sorts of wildlife. There was a lot of trail and road maintenance to be done my first summer. They were also working on a program monitoring populations of several wildlife species, so I was scheduled to be working outdoors in one way or another. For practically the entire season. One task I had been working on was rerouting an access road and part of a hiking trail around an area that had been washed out by some unusually heavy rains. It was a big undertaking so we had been working in teams to get it done by the end of the fall season. Normally the teams consisted of four or five people at a time. But sometimes we were stuck working with just one or two others, depending on the other needs in the area. Things were going well with the project. So I was able to take a small vacation. Four days hiking in the Rockies in Wyoming. The day I drove home from my trip, I swung by the forest. There were still at least an hour of daylight left. And I was curious to see how far the rest of the crew got on the project. I don't know why I just didn't wait until morning, when I came into work. I should have waited until morning. I went down the old access road and it looked like they had taken down several more trees to make a larger parking area. I saw something move in the underbrush at the edge of the forest. I stopped my car and turned the radio down. It looked like something large, maybe an elk or a bear. I couldn't quite tell. The sun was setting quickly. I thought I had more time than that but night comes early in the mountains. And has a hard time getting through the trees if you're in the woods. I waited in my car to see if I could get a better look at the animal. I knew if I got out I would likely scare it away. Out of nowhere I heard a loud crash and a tree topple over right next to my car. It was insane. The whole car shook when it fell. I couldn't believe the odds, or how lucky I was that it didn't crush me. I got out of the car and took a look at the fallen tree. It looked healthy, 
No signs of decay. It didn't come up at the roots. But rather looked like it just broke off and fell. The whole thing was strange but I was tired from my trip and just wanted to get back home. I was about to get back into my car when I heard another tree break apart and fall. It landed just a few feet away from the previous one. At this point I didn't know what was going on. If a third tree fell, it would probably land right on me. I knew I had to get out of there. I had to turn the car around and maneuver around the fallen trees. And then I saw it standing there in the forest. The creature was knocking down the trees. I saw its eyes shine in my headlights. They were gold. I would guess it had to stand between 8 or 9 feet tall. Its whole body was covered in hair. Blank and ape are some similar animal. Saying it looked like Bigfoot or Sasquatch, makes me sound like a crazy person. But that's really the only thing that it could have been. I don't know what else out there looks like that. It definitely wasn't a bear. It had these human hands and just thick hair all over its body. I didn't stick around long after that. It started shaking another tree. And I drove out of there. There were three trees down when the team got there for work the next day. I ended up telling my co-workers about this but they just thought I was crazy. I'm a skeptic of the supernatural, but I believe anything is possible. I won't discount supernatural occurrences if I can't find a logical explanation for them. I've experienced a few incidents I couldn't explain, but I'm going to tell you about the one that freaked me out the most, though. So here it goes. I live in the Twin Cities, in Minnesota, USA. A lot of people in the cities have cabins in either northern MN or rural Wisconsin. Our cabin was in rural Wisconsin, in a small town called Danbury. The cabin is on Long Lake, at the very end of Long Lake Road along with the cabin came almost an acre of land, covered by thick forest. We carved a trail through the land for ATVs and whatnot. So, the scene is set. Now, about me. I'm an outdoor enthusiast and have been forever. I'm 6 feet 4, fit, and have been a hunter since I was like 12. I know my environment, the wildlife, and the forest well and am typically comfortable in the woods. I come from a military family and am trained in multiple forms of combat, armed and unarmed. I also have extensive firearms training and as a result, am fairly confident in my ability to defend myself. I'm not really scared of people. Big predators on the other hand, like bears, wolves, man bear pig, whatever, I'm not a big fan of. This brings me to the weirdness. I'm 23 now, but at the time of the incident, I was 16. Even at 16, I was a decent hunter and had good common sense. Anyway, I was at the cabin with my cousin and grandparents. It was the middle of summer, I think July, with hot temps and whatnot. My cousin and I were shooting at each other with airsoft guns. We had a full-on battle going on throughout the property, including the woods, which were my stalking grounds. I was wearing my BDUs, with face cover and all, as well as head to toe camo. Our battle ended up about 100 yards northwest of the cabin, into the woods. We ended the war on the main trail and were standing and talking about the events that had transpired. I was still on guard because I always am. I suppose I could be considered to be a tad paranoid. Alright, so we were standing there talking when I noticed something move at our 12 o'clock about 50 meters out. I got quiet and focused dead ahead, scanning. My cousin was still talking, so I whispered, shh. So, he shut up. I figured the movement I had seen was just a bird or something. As a joke and to freak him out, I told him we were being watched. That's when I noticed that the woods were dead quiet. No birds were chirping. There was no sound. That's when I started to think, this only happens when a big predator is around. So, I started looking even closer. That's when I saw it. At my 12 o'clock, there was this large animal. It had reddish, brown fur and almost blended in perfectly until I focused on it. It had long front limbs, arm-like, with what appeared to be formidable claws and it was standing kind of slouched down, against a tree, 
like it was trying to be stealthy. Even though it was standing like that, it was nearly as tall as me. The only reason why I saw it was because of its teeth. I think it was panting because its whitish teeth were visible. Its snout appeared to be a tad elongated. I couldn't get a better look, because my first thought was, we have to go. I even said it out loud. My cousin was already freaked. When I said those words, he bolted up the trail, towards the cabin. He nearly left me in the dust, because instead of running when he did, I waited a good three seconds, I was being protective of him, keeping my eye on it, until I saw it move, it was fast. That's when I ran like hell. I didn't see which way it ran. All I know is that I heard it crashing through the woods. My cousin stopped at the shed, which was still 50 meters from the cabin, to wait for me. When I caught up, I yelled, go, go, go. And we both bolted to the cabin. We got inside and shut the door. My grandma asked why we looked panicked and had slammed the door shut. I knew they wouldn't believe me, so I said that we had seen a bear. My cousin nodded. Later that night, after my grandparents went to sleep, we talked about it. I asked my cousin if he had seen it. He told me that he had paused for a second, to look back, after he ran, to see if I was running with him. He said that he had seen me still looking at it. He said that's when he saw it move and I run. He said he had mostly just seen a flash of fur. He went on to say, he thought it wasn't the right color to be a bear. I also agreed that it wasn't the right color to be one and told him that we only had black bears in the area and that it wasn't built like a bear either. I told him I never thought it was a bear. He asked me why I had lied about it to my grandparents. I told him they wouldn't have believed us. We've kept it between the two of us, until now. Still, the animal didn't match any known regional animal profiles in the area. I'm at a loss for what it may have been. I do know it was stalking us though and that it was built like an athletic predator. Not like a bear. It wasn't as heavy set as a bear would have been. After the incident, neither of us would go into the woods on foot, alone, without a gun. We generally only went back in the woods on ATVs from that point forward. I always loved that cabin, up until then. Fortunately, the cabin has been sold now. I'm a 32-year-old lady, from the very northern tip of West Virginia. Most of my life has been lived in Hancock County. When I was little, we camped in tents, walked everywhere, hiked at parks, all that outside goodness. In my teens, we started going to state parks, to ride horses. I've been to Tomlinson Run, Beaver Creek State Park, Salt Fork, Raccoon Creek, and Vista Park, I think that was the name. We had a friend who was constantly inviting us to ride on people's land she had received permission from. I'm well acquainted with the local wildlife. I've seen all the major players, including koi dogs, and bears, and can identify most sounds in the forest. I love watching nature documentaries. I was looking to become a vet, so I studied a lot, on animals. Drawing and painting them got me very acquainted with animal anatomy. Was I ever into cryptozoology? Yes. I was a Dino crazy, little girl. My one babysitter had Reader's Digest Mysteries of the Unexplained. The thought of a plesiosaur, in Scotland or an apatosaurus, in the Congo, was just mind-blowing. Later in life, I started looking at it like folklore. It was interesting to read the accounts and learn the theories behind what people were seeing but I believed in them as much as a folklorist believes in dragons and trolls. I didn't have any interest in Bigfoot and I'd never heard of dogmen. I never had interest in looking, nor did the thoughts ever cross my mind. It seems I didn't need to go looking, they found me. We moved to the farm when I was about 10. Mom's dream was to have horses and she was finally able to live it. The farmhouse was haunted, mainly by the former residents of the house. I never felt threatened by them, though. It's a little unnerving to have two men talking and moving the couch you're sitting on. Or should I say, it sounded like it. No one was home, no media was on, and yet, I was hearing two men, 
talking about how they were going to move the couch, and where, and the sound of furniture being dragged, right from under me. The land, itself, had its share of strangeness. Most things were benign, though. We just shrugged and carried on. I honestly hated our woods. Anywhere else, I'd freely hike, but even in the yard, sometimes I felt watched. Heck, sometimes I thought something was staring in our windows. Now that I think of it, we did have things slam into our trailer. I'd think it was a horse that had gotten loose, but when I'd go out, to investigate, I'd find nothing. I'd chalk it up to a deer. I used my horse's breeds for their names, rather than think up names for them. Anyone who knows me knew my horse's names. I was 18 to 19, in this encounter. By this time, we gave up on cows, I hate, hate, hate them, and just had the horses and chickens. Someone knocked on the door, at 2 am. I'd only been asleep 2 hours, but years of conditioning had my heart pumping and my mind clearing. Someone knocking that early meant trouble. It usually meant horses or livestock had gotten out. I wasn't disappointed. Our neighbor said the horses were in his yard. My mind wasn't totally awake, so I didn't think to ask which yard they were in. My stepfather came out, asked what was up, and told me they were my horses, so deal with it. Mom was working. That was nothing new. This lot of horses had three expert escape artists. I had the routine down. It was pretty dark out, but I did have some moonlight, to help. The security light only went so far. Then, of course, it shut off, after so long. When it was cloudy, you literally had to watch that you didn't walk off, into the ravine, it was so pitch. I was naturally in a foul mood, cursing my horses, and wondering if some drunk had gone through the fence, again. It happened a lot. As I got closer to the brown barn, I realized a horse was flipping out. It was running back and forth, squealing, and carrying on. I went in and grabbed the halters and leads. I paused for a moment, to see if any other horse or horses had replied to the horse I heard squeal. That would give me an idea where the other horse or horses might be. There was no reply. That was odd. I was thinking, crap. They're on the other side of the hill. It was the only reason in my mind they wouldn't be replying. Let's just say, when they followed our cut trails, to the other side, it took us an hour to traverse through the woods and lead them back. And even with two guys, on a four-wheeler, and my mom, that was a freaky trek. I felt like I was being watched and followed. Maybe, it wasn't paranoia. So, the land is set up like this. The brown barn was connected to a small pasture, about half an acre long, which then connects to a seven acre pasture. Pretty much in the center, on the outside edge of the large pasture, was an old, white barn, that we turned into a run-in. I decided to tackle the horse still in the fence, so I could bring her down to the small pasture, to keep her from escaping too. Maybe, the others would follow. I had to walk clear to the other side of the pasture, to get to the panicking horse. It was my mother's psycho Appaloosa mare. I tried to catch her and nearly got trampled, a few times trying. She was frothing at the mouth and her eye whites were really showing. Was I alarmed? No. As I said, psycho. I noticed my other six were across the road. They were standing in a tiny, little fenced-in area, under a spotlight. They were standing motionless and not touching a blade of grass. I was wondering how the neighbor managed to herd them into that tiny fenced-in area, with that tiny door. Three of those horses were over 16 hands tall. One was a draft horse cross. The doorway was actually small enough, he touched both sides, going through. My thoroughbred mare took me two hours to corral, the last time she got out, much to my frustration, she was an awesome jumper. So, a stranger rounding them up and putting them into a tiny yard was mind-blowing. I've had horses since I was nine. I'm 32 now. I've had ponies and horses. I've had Appaloosas, Arabians, draft horses, quarter horses, walking horses, saddlebreds, thoroughbreds, Mustangs, 
foals, geldings, mares, and geldings that still thought they were stallions. I've had a lot of horses, from all walks of life. I will tell you, they consistently do not like to be crammed into tight spaces, especially, not in a group. I had two severely abused horses, I was rehabbing, a thoroughbred that actually had PTSD, and a racking horse, that actually took me three years to touch, without some sort of a bad reaction. They did not like being in stalls, and all but one were mares. Mares are extremely moody and two of mine were particularly vicious, to those they didn't like. My walker mare only liked three other horses. She should have been kicking the crap out of the others there. Mine also didn't like to be under lights, when they escaped. They avoided them like the plague. And not eating grass, that was over ankle deep? That was unheard of. They were silent and dead still. My neighbor came out and told me that they were like that when he found them. He asked me if I needed help, but I said, no. My thoroughbred and racking horse mares did not like men. I told him I'd take them out, one at a time. I took one halter and lead and threw the rest outside the gate. I put the halter on my gelding and opened the gate, to lead him out. They had other plans, though. All six came out, as a freaking unit. They were literally chest to butt, crammed together. My gelding and my Welsh mare had their chest pushing against me as we walked back to the brown barn. Normally, they did not do this. I wouldn't usually allow such bad behavior. We were on the main road, which I did not like. The speed limit is only 35, but people go 60. So, I tried to lead them through the large pasture gate. They wouldn't even go on that side of the road, though. I was a little unnerved, by their behavior. So I lead them down to the brown barn and they went in. They were skittish, though, picking at the hay I threw out, walking around restlessly, sticking to the barn like glue, and eyeing the upper pasture. I rationalize it by thinking, it's the appy flipping out, that's unnerving them. And why hadn't she come down yet? She had to have seen us all walk down. I rushed to the gate, between the little and big pastures, out of habit. I didn't want the herd to go back out, into the big pasture. I didn't have to worry. They didn't follow me, like they usually did. The gate was wide open, but the appy was still running and squealing, back and forth, in the same area. I started to go get her. Now, the neighbor's security lights didn't really light up my pasture. The road was higher than my pasture, so it was cast, in a shadow. I could make out her shape and some detail, though. She took off, at a panicked gallop, swerved sideways, and jumped the stream. When she landed, she nearly landed on her face. She caught herself though and took off, at a dead gallop, again. I ducked behind a stump. If she would have hit me, I would have been dead. I went back and chained the gate. I decided to forego looking her over until I got the halters and leads. She was too hot at the moment. I decided to walk on the road, instead of through the pasture, again. The pasture was uneven, unlit, and full of springs. Sometime during this, clouds had taken over the sky. So there was no moonlight, to see by. The spot, on the road, where I was at, was paved and pretty well lit, though, my neighbor was paranoid as mentioned. I had almost gotten to the white barn, when I got this sudden urge, to stop and look at a very specific spot, in the pasture. I would like to say, it was instinct that told me to look, but usually, I'd scan the woods first, to see what was watching me. That's usually where the watchers are. Instead, I just flicked on my flashlight, right on a certain spot. It was extremely close to where the mare was flipping out. I saw red eye shine. My first thought was, why in the world would a deer be there, with all that chaos? I was feeling a sense of extreme dread and didn't know why. Besides, it being where my horse was going nuts, told me, something else just wasn't right. I then realized, where the eyes were, relative to the walnut trees and my racing barrels. See, the road is above the pasture and the walnut trees were right at the same elevation, as the road. The pasture itself is sloped, to deal with the runoff, 
from the road. The barrel, it was next to, was on the low end of the incline. The barrels were white, so I could see a dim lighting, from my flashlight, on the one it was next to. This thing was too freaking big to be a deer. I was frozen, standing there, watching it. I just had this feeling, it was evil and that I had to keep track of those eyes. It was watching me. It slowly blinked a few times. It also looked over, into the woods, above the pasture. I know you ask your guests if they ever feel there are other ones out there. Well, let me tell you, it crossed my mind. With a sinking stomach, I flashed my flashlight over the woods, to see if I would catch eyeshine. I didn't see any, though. So, I went right back to the eyes. They were still there. I flicked back and forth, making sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I don't know how long I stood there, watching, frozen. Someone could have come around the bend and hit me, with their car, I was so focused. Finally, it started to move off. It glanced at me, sideways, a few times, only one eye. I think it went into the copse of trees, around the creek. I heard nothing. That wasn't surprising, though. The horses were still restless and making noises. I stood there, a long time after, looking for I shine. I was wondering if it could have been a bear. I didn't think so though. The eyes were consistent, in height, until it disappeared. Bears are clumsy, on their back legs. On this uneven, inclined ground, I have no doubt a bear would have dropped to the ground, to go on all fours. Even the rear up and drop down behavior bears do, when they're trying to see something, wouldn't work. We had one cross our pasture before. He made a lot of noise, going through the woods. The horses settled down quicker with the bear. I was almost to my neighbors, at this point. I considered leaving the couple, hundred dollars of tack, at his house, halters and leads aren't cheap. I had no doubt, if I left them there, they'd be gone in the morning. My mother would be pissed. So, I darted over, grabbed them, and ran like a bat out of hell. I know, I know. I should have left the tack. I also know, you're not supposed to run, but I couldn't even conceive what I had just seen. I got into the barn, threw the tack down, and hung with the horses. I wasn't going to go back up that pitch black driveway, on foot. I figured, with the horses, I'd have a warning, and the barn had plenty of sharp things. I didn't go back up, until dawn. I was frozen stiff by that time. I've had years to think this over. It unnerves the crap out of me. How long was that thing there? Was that what was keeping the appy mare from coming down? Was it right there, in the shadows, while I was trying to catch her or was it in the unlit barn, I walked through, to get to the road? Was it the reason the appy swerved and nearly fell? How did my horses get out? I never did find how they got out. Did they panic and jump the fence? I did check the fence line, away from the woods. I did look for tracks, around the barrel. Sadly, the ground was hard, from frost that morning. But, I will say, the appy mare was running for a good while. The ground was severely torn up and turned into a muddy, mess, it was high noon when I went down there, to check, and the ground had melted. I'll bet it was her, that woke the neighbor up. It took them about a week, to fully settle. I don't know if whatever it was was still in the area or if they were that traumatized. It wasn't too long after that, my mother filed for divorce. My, ex-stepfather got the farm and I moved in with her, in the city. Even with all of the weird crap going on there, there were non-bipedal things going on too, I miss it terribly. Maybe it's more accurate to say, I miss the farm life rather than the actual place. I'd love to get back onto a farm again, but I'd probably hesitate to move back there. I never told anyone about the eye shine event. I didn't see the actual creature and really, how do you convey that unnatural slash horror inducing feeling? You saw I shine, whoop dee doo. My mother would have given me the benefit of the doubt, but my mother often told family members things. They made my life enough of a living hell. I didn't want to give them more ammo.
This incident occurred in Memphis, Tennessee. I started my career as a Memphis police officer a few years previously in the 1980s. I was on a special assignment at the time. It was 2 a.m. and it was a clear summer night but quite humid. I was in my personal vehicle with the top down and the radio playing. I was still in my uniform including my bulletproof vest and a gun belt with all the regular equipment attached to it. I was heading south on Covington Pike at a good rate of speed and was the only one on the road. This part of the road connects the Raleigh Bartlett area to the Berclair area. The road is slightly elevated as the surrounding area is low and running through it is the Wolf River which is a few miles from here and connects to the Mississippi River. This area is commonly referred to by the locals as the Wolf River Bottoms these days. As I was driving, in my peripheral vision over to my right just outside my headlight beams, I noticed something was moving fast directly toward the front of my car. I immediately slammed on the brakes, thinking that a deer was running across the road. But, I couldn't have been more wrong. It came to a screeching halt right in the middle of the road right in front of my headlights, not more than seven feet from my bumper. As we both froze in place staring at each other for several seconds. It appeared to be three to four feet tall but was also crouched. It could have been closer to five if it stood straight up, but I got the impression that its current body posture was its normal way of standing. It had a large head, at least compared to its skinny slender body. It appeared to be dark gray and greenish in color, similar to the color of an alligator but the appearance of its skin looked like a similar texture to a human's. It had dark large oval eyes on each side of the upper part of its face running slanted from the top portion of its head to about the midsection of its head. It was kind of pointing inward to where you would expect a nose to be. However, from what I could tell, there was no distinct nose. At least none like a human. Below the eyes was a very thin dark almost black line which I assumed was its mouth. It ran from about the same location a human's mouth would be, however, the line ran straight across the lower face in front and then turned upward and slightly back on the head. It had no ears that could see. Its body and chest area were rounded like a human but vastly smaller, almost like a child's. Its arms appeared to be longer and somewhat disproportionate to its body and they were skinny and had an insect-type look to them. I could make out hands but they were also completely folded at the wrist joint. The legs were long because, even with this thing's shortness, I could make out the top of them even with it so close to the bumper which was obscuring the bottom half somewhat. They were like the arms, thin and insect-like, but appeared to be jointed. I did notice its chest area moving slightly like it was breathing but it seemed slow and steady. I never noticed anything like genitalia. There was no hair any place that I could see and I'm not even sure if it was wearing any type of clothing. If it was it would have had to be skin tight. I never noticed a tail at any point. My adrenaline was pumping and it was only a brief period of observation. It again took off like a shot and it was out of my headlights. I could still make out its outline in the darkness and it was moving like a sprinter. It leapt over the guardrail onto the other side of the road and down the embankment. I will admit that this was not the only bizarre incident that I had during my career but it definitely was the strangest. I never told anyone on the force about the encounter. In fact, I only mentioned it to a close friend during these many years. I can only identify it as a lizard man or an unknown humanoid. I would have never believed it unless I actually witnessed it. I work on an oil rig. My job is to run an excavator and mix off the mud that comes out of the ground, and do stuff that needs big machine. Because of the locations of these rigs I have to drive to pretty remote places in the wilderness of Canada. Anywho, one of the light towers at the edge of the lease went out. I went over and in the forest I could see these weird like fireflies type of things, but like the size of a basketball. But they weren't bright like they weren't lighting things up around them. Then I started feeling super uneasy. In between some trees I could see this big ass silhouette of a person with red glowing eyes. I ran back into the machine just to see it walking away. 
When I was in it I ended up telling the crew and I'm not the only one who's seen it. Like half of them have seen it and two of them have had it smile at them. WTF is this thing? Also I'm so sorry for the bad grammar. My father and I had just left the La Borbuja grocery store and were crossing 30 seconds to go toward my car when we heard what sounded like a baby crying out. We thought it was maybe one of the neighbor's babies but then my father said Mira Mija and was pointing toward the house across the street. I looked and saw a thin black figure perched on the brick fence post and looking directly at us. This thing was dark, dark black it actually looked like it was absorbing the light around it. It was very easy to make out the body, the wings, and the long pointed tail that it swished around much like a cat does when it is interested in something. The eyes were the most striking feature as they were glowing bright red and were locked directly on my father and me. I was frozen in fear and the only thing going through my mind was how to defend my elderly father if this thing decided to attack us. I could care less about myself but my father is 70 years old and not able to move or defend himself if he was attacked. I could hear my father praying and asking La Virgin de Guadalupe for protection and to send this thing away. I managed to tell my father that we needed to get into the car as quickly as possible so we could be safe. I pressed the button to the remote and the horn chirped as the alarm was deactivated and the doors unlocked. At the sound of the horn chirping this thing opened its wings and stood up on the fence post and chirped back at us. It took off and hovered for a few seconds, its wings flapping and making a light whoosh sound. My father and I dove into the relative safety of the car as this thing flew away and was gone from our sight. This thing was maybe 3 to 4 feet tall and thin but its wings were large and maybe 10 feet when spread apart. They looked a lot like bat wings, no feathers were visible as it was jet black. We drove straight home and my father told my mother and my sister about our encounter with this thing and what had happened. My mother said it was probably a bruja disguised as a lechusa and that we were lucky we were not attacked, either way, she refused to let anyone out of the house for the rest of the night. I just read about the realtor that saw the werewolf in San Bernardino County, California. I saw a dog man in the North Verdemont area of Devore, California in 1998. I grew up there and I personally know others who have seen the same creature in the same general area. It's not a hoax. Anyone who lived in that area for a long time could tell you that they either experienced or heard stories of strange things roaming around the wilderness. At that time, it was still very rural and undeveloped. I had a conversation with a native man from the San Manuel Tribal Band of Mission Indians, Uaviatam clan of Mariam, Serrano peoples. He told me that he believed it may have been a medicine man from his tribe and that we were lucky to have ever seen the creature, as many of their people have only ever heard stories and never seen one for themselves. I was 13 or 14 years old at the time. That night, my band had played a Battle of the Bands show at the Showcase Theater in Corona. When we came home from the show, I went to the side of the house, near a shed, to take a piss and smoke a cigarette butt that I had stashed. I looked out into the field and gazed upon the trees and familiar scenery that I have known my whole life. I know the landscape perfectly. But one thing was out of place and at first, I couldn't tell what it was I was seeing. What I saw was what appeared at first to be a man walking, then running through the field on the side of my parents' house, in the early AM hours. Maybe 1 or 2 AM. This was extremely out of the ordinary, for the time and place, no one would ever be out there. Its movement didn't look normal. Its legs were funny. Then I noticed it had the head of a dog. Like a coyote or a German shepherd. I was heading north towards the mountains with the strangest movements. I can't describe it. It just didn't look natural. Eventually, it was out of my view. I can't remember if I heard any sound from it running. It was far enough away that I don't recall how it sounded. I just can't forget how strange it looked while it was running. Or galloping. Not sure there's a word to describe its movement. Well, that's my story, exactly how it happened. 
So I absolutely believe the realtor. I tucked this away and never told anybody before. We live in Southern California east of Los Angeles and this incident occurred in 1996. My wife and I were leaving home early this particular morning. It was still dark. As we were trying to get on the major highway near our home when we hit something coming out of a residential construction area. It ran extremely fast in front of the car. I had no time to stop so I hit this thing. I came to a stop as soon as possible. I told my wife I was going to get out and take a look at what I hit. She begged me not to get out. I was sure that I had hit a dog. I stepped out and as I rounded the car the headlights of my car shone upon something that I'd never seen before. It was disturbing. I backed up a little bit and I realized what I had hit wasn't a dog. I have owned and trained large dogs for most of my life, but nothing compared to the size of this thing. Nothing about it resembled what I would say was a domesticated canine. Everything about this was wild and bulky. It had what looked like a lion's mane. It had teeth that looked like it came out of a Hollywood horror movie. I can't even begin to describe the fright I had in seeing this thing. I backed up a bit more. I could see its teeth were unusually big and sharp and there was a pool of blood forming underneath its mouth. Its eyes were open but yet it wasn't moving. I could still see the bright amber I color. My wife stepped out of the car and asked what it was. I said I don't know. We got in. I backed up and drove around it. I said if it's still there when we get back home we'll take a closer look. Later that day, when we got back, it was gone. A dried pool of blood was the only evidence that remained. To this day we kept quiet about the incident. So, 26 years later, I now felt compelled to come forward. Not because I feel guilty about the experience, but because I had another unexplained sighting. We live in the same home as we did when the previous incident occurred. One evening, I was a few blocks away from my house going through a house that I was getting ready to sell. I am a realtor and own a real estate business. When I was finished, I exited the front door of the house, walked to my car that was parked in the driveway, and got in. As I backed up into the street, I observed a large upright beast cross behind me. I immediately stopped and looked out the passenger window. This creature was running on two legs in between the house and the neighbor's property. I sat in the car dumbfounded by what I had just witnessed. Then I had a flashback to the incident in 1996. I quickly realized that this was either the same creature or something very similar. That was the last time I saw this creature. But now I realize that there is an unknown upright, canine-like beast living in the area. Thinking back to the latest encounter I estimate that it easily stood 8 feet in height and it had a very human-like gait when it was running. I have read your posts about dog man and upright canines, and I now believe that this is what I witnessed on both occasions. If I see it again, I will inform you. Hello everyone. About two months ago my wife, son, and I moved to northern Alabama. We're in a rural area surrounded by many cattle and hearse fields. A couple times per week right around 1.30 to 2 a.m. our two large dogs will go absolutely ballistic and bark slash growl at the front door, but nothing is outside. Our ring camera hasn't really caught anything. Recently, I've been having weird dreams, alien encounters, coyote invasions, etc. I don't say anything to my wife or son about these dreams, but every time I have them my son tells us about his dreams. The night I had a dream that aliens were hovering around our house in a UFO trying to abduct us he had a dream about aliens. The night I had a dream about coyotes being in the cattle field attacking our cats he had a dream about coyotes too. There's been nothing said slash done during the day related to aliens or coyotes. Anyone have any idea of any creatures in northern Alabama that would cause this? This happened around 2008 to 2009 and I am just now telling the story. I am 56 years old now. I have told two people about this. 
I was on Telegraph Road heading south towards Toledo, Ohio. I had just picked up my brother in LaSalle, Michigan. He is two years younger than me. I was driving and he was in the passenger seat. We had just passed a horse farm and then there was a stretch of wooded area. Not thick woods, just quite a few trees. I was driving 55 miles per hour. Then something to the right of me caught my eye. I looked over to see my brother with a stunned look on his face staring out at this thing also. There was this thing in the woods, flying and keeping pace with us. My very first thought was it was a man with a jetpack flying. Then I realized it had wings. This thing was probably 7 to 8 feet long and had huge wings. It was black in color. It was almost racing us, it seemed. It then turned its head and looked at us. Big red eyes. My brother and looked at each other. We didn't say anything for a few seconds. One of us said, did you see that? And we both said, WTF was that? We looked back over and it was gone. I slowed down a bit and we kept looking but didn't see it. Just today, I text my brother and asked if he remembered this. He said yes, it haunts him and he doesn't tell anyone because they would call him crazy. That's how I feel. I have tried not thinking about it, telling myself it was a turkey vulture, it definitely was not, and other things. If my brother would have said no, I wouldn't be writing this. I am well respected in my community. I am an ordinance officer and my daughter is a sheriff's deputy. Thank you for letting me tell my story finally. It is quite a relief. Nothing else really makes sense. Let me explain, my family would go camping every chance we got. The place we'd always go had no natural predators, at least, nothing bigger than a fox. My dad specifically chose this spot so us kids, me and my two siblings, could frolic through the woods without having to worry. This particular trip was during the May long weekend. There was still a considerable amount of snow, so my dad brought our ATVs and some sleds for us. It was the day after we had arrived, and my dad wanted to go on a little trip down the road we came up. I asked if I could come, and he said sure. We both hopped on his quad and set out on our little trip. I forgot to mention earlier that we had deer around the area. Nothing crazy, but the odd one would wander through our campsite. You could tell they had no natural predators, since they didn't run away when there was a human around. My siblings and I would always manage to get pretty close to one, before my parents yelled at us to stay away, that is. Anyway, My dad and I were a few miles from the campsite when we rounded a corner, and came across one me of the most gruesome sights I have ever seen in my life. On the side of the road were the pieces of a deer, at least, I think it was one. There was blood absolutely everywhere, worse still, there was steam coming from the remains, which meant this was a recent kill. My dad is usually a pretty calm guy, not much can rattle him. But I could tell that this freaked him the hell out. He was in the process of turning us around when this, I don't know, screech came from the forest. It was so loud, we both flinched. I remember searching the forest for the source, but my dad was in the process of hauling us down the way we came. It could have been a trick of the light, or because I was freaked out and maybe I was seeing things. But, I could have sworn I saw something running alongside us, but only for a second or two. I know I sound absolutely crazy, but the thing looked like a large dog before it vanished into the trees. My dad raced back to camp and we were all packed up and headed to a different location by the end of the day. We never did go back to that campsite after this encounter. I did ask my dad about it a couple years ago, he just said it was because the new campsite was better than the old, better trails and whatnot. I think he's full of crap. I think whatever we encountered that day scared the hell out of him, and I think that whatever I saw, he did too. But I, for one, am thankful we never went back. I'm not sure if I would be able to sleep at night after what I saw. It still haunts me till this day. I was a junior park ranger, newly stationed at Yosemite National Park. I had only been on the job for a few weeks, 
but I was excited to be out in the wilderness, working to protect and preserve one of the most beautiful places on earth. One morning, I received an emergency call from a camper who had become lost deep in the woods. My supervisor sent me to rescue him, and I eagerly set off on my mission. As I hiked deeper into the forest, the towering trees blocked out the sun and the only sound was the crunching of my boots on the forest floor. I had been searching for hours when I heard something rustling in the bushes up ahead. I cautiously approached, thinking it might be the lost camper. But what I saw was unlike anything I could have imagined. Standing before me was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. It was tall and humanoid in shape, but its skin was a mottled, dark brown and its eyes were black and soulless. Large, leathery wings protruded from its back, and it had a long, sharp beak that looked capable of tearing flesh. It was a Mothman creature, and it was terrifying. I froze in place, unable to move as the creature lunged at me. I managed to dodge out of the way at the last moment, but one of its wings brushed against my arm, leaving a deep gash. I stumbled backwards, my mind racing as I tried to think of a way to defend myself. The creature let out an ear-piercing screech and took flight, disappearing into the trees. I felt a surge of relief that it was gone, but I knew I needed to get help fast. I reached for my radio, but there was no response when I called for assistance. I was lost in the woods and alone, with a monster on the loose. I tried to make my way back to the trailhead, but it was as if the forest was against me. Every time I thought I was getting close, I found myself in a thicket of thorns or a marshy bog. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, and I knew that the creature was out there, stalking me. As the day turned into night and the darkness closed in, my fear turned to desperation. I was lost injured, and alone in the woods with a terrifying creature hunting me. I knew that if I didn't find a way out soon, it was only a matter of time before the Mothman found me. I thought about my family, my friends, my dreams, and all the things I would never be able to accomplish. I knew that it was the end for me. The creature killed me or I will die of hunger and exposure. My fate would remain a mystery, another unsolved case of a missing park ranger in the wilds of Yosemite. But the Mothman creature, that terrifying being, it would continue to haunt the woods, waiting for its next victim. And for anyone who dared to venture too deep into the wilderness, the memory of my encounter would be a chilling warning of the dangers that lurked in the shadows. I used to work on a hospital campus at a place where patients receiving treatment stayed. It was like Ronald McDonald House but for adults. I usually worked second shift. There were a little bit of woods around the place and a walking path. After turning down the lights and just having a lamp on at the front desk the place became a little eerie. As long as we check in and out patients and answer the phones we are allowed to sit there and read. Now I should mention that I've had a few creepy experiences there and consider myself somewhat of a sensitive. On this particular night I had been reading about the Fae and people's encounters. I had also been learning about opening up my third eye. I like to read about all kinds of things. I am spiritual but skeptical too. Well it was getting to be close to the end of my shift and I started getting ready to leave. As I walked out of the automatic door, nobody around. I got the distinctive feeling someone was walking behind me. So much so that the hair on the back of my neck stood up. As I got to my car I turned around to see if someone was there and there was no one. I then heard a high pitch giggle from the bushes. I got goose bumps all over and got the hell out of there. My husband and I were walking the 3.2 mile loop trail that encircles Lost Lake. We were about 2 miles around when we heard a sound come from the other side of the lake way off in the distance. It actually sounded as if it were coming from high up on the mountain on the other side of the lake. It was a howl slash call sound. It was extremely quiet and since the birds and other sounds were so clear, we are very sure it was miles away. The sound started low and guttural and reached an amazingly high pitch. 
It was fairly short in duration and my husband and I both stopped walking as soon as we heard it. We are wondering if anyone else heard it. We only passed two or three other people on the trail. It was a very quiet fall afternoon. After listening to your audio clips on this website it sounded most like the sounds recorded in the Klamath area of California in 1993. It might also be of interest that one of the camper sightings in this area from around 94 to 96 was at the exact time of day in the Lost Lake area. While sighting in my son's rifle we heard what sounded like large tree branches breaking. This was heard once by me and three or four times by my son. There was no one else around the area. As we were leaving I saw some deer tracks alongside the road on a bank and right by the deer tracks was an impression that looked like a big bare foot. I had my son put a popkin next to it and took several pictures of it. I can't say for sure it is a BF print, but it looks a lot like the ones I have seen on this and other sites. This is a difficult thing for me to write down, on paper. I had no idea what a cryptid was until my son told me about his encounter, just before it aired on your show. All these years, I have thought that what I had seen was just a very deformed bear. Just so you know, I was driving that night and I never drink and drive. I was 100% sober. I haven't even talked about my encounter since it happened. Until I told my son. Since then, I have told my best friend. She encouraged me to contact you, after we listened to my son's episode together. Most evenings, just about an hour before dark, some of us enjoyed going for deer rides. We had a route we would always use. It started out on Rustic Road, which was southwest of our cabin, on Long Lake, just south of Danbury, Wisconsin. The route took us to a place that went through a wildlife preserve, and then we ended up on the road that goes from Hinkley, Minnesota to Danbury, Wisconsin. The road through the preserve always made me uncomfortable, because it was a swampy bog on both sides of the road. It was a narrow gravel road and in order to turn around, you would need to go down a very narrow drive, to a parking area for hunters. I had only been in one of those parking areas once and it creeped me out. We never saw a deer on that road, so we typically went fast in that area. We would have avoided the gravel road altogether, but we always saw a deer just before the preserve and just after. On this evening, it was just my sister-in-law and I that went on the deer ride. This happened 15 or 16 years ago, so we did not have cell phones. Sometimes, we would take cameras to take pictures of deer. This night, we didn't have a camera with us. It was a hot night, and we had our windows down because the air conditioner wasn't working. I was driving a large car. A 1998 Cadillac. We had just started down that creepy road, when we noticed something black on the road, about a half a mile ahead of us. We were driving pretty fast. As we got closer, it appeared to be dark gray in color. It also appeared to have an elongated muzzle. It had its back to us, but it was a little sideways, so we could tell it was eating something in the road. I stopped the car and just kept my foot on the brake. This animal had very wide, muscular shoulders and its fur was longer than a bear's. Its ears were pointy, like a German shepherd's and stood straight up, on top of its head. This animal had hands. It was holding a dead rabbit, I think. I was talking to Amy. I said, what is that? I think I was verbalizing every thought that came into my head. I was totally freaked out. The animal noticed us. It started to turn its head. That's when I turned on my headlights. It wasn't dark yet, but I wanted to see this thing better. It turned and faced my car. The headlights caught its eyes. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Its eyes glowed reddish-orange in the headlights. I freaked. To me, this creature was demonic in nature. Then it stood up straight, on its back legs. As this thing moved, it was jerky, like it wasn't comfortable in its own skin. It was not a natural movement. The animal sprinted at my car. It took at least six steps. I gunned my car right at it. I was in a panic. 
I was terrified. It turned right, still upright, then dropped to all fours. Its legs had an odd bend in them, like backward knees. I just screamed, what is that? It ran into the swamp and I got the hell out of there. We stopped on the road to our cabin. By then it was dark. When we stopped, Amy and I both cried. We couldn't stop shaking. We talked about what we had just seen. We both agreed, we would tell people we had seen a bear. To be honest, at that time, I honestly thought it was a deformed bear. Today, I know it was not. I am no longer in denial. What I saw, I cannot understand or explain. It was just plain evil in nature. So wrong. Very wrong. I left my home driving to work. I took my usual route which is Grouse Flats Road we are out in an isolated area where there is nothing but farm fields and woods. And at approximately 5.40 am I seen something in my headlights crossing the gravel road. It was a large bulky figure and as I was approaching closer I could see it was covered with a lot of hair, it appeared to be dark brown. It seemed to be taller than average height and it moved at a quick pace. I was only seeing a side view of it but it had a long arm which was moving in a very exaggerated way not like how a person would move their arm. It never stopped to look at me or anything, it just kept moving. Thought I would share my story, myself and bunch of buddies went camping for 4 days up near Steamboat, but below, about 35 miles away from Oak Ridge. We camp at this spot up in the middle of nowhere, it's a nice stop, close to the river and open for our campers. We camp with dogs. Well, everything was nice and cool, until myself and a friend took our quads down river on some trails, park, then started catching some nice natives, and you know once you start fishing you always want to move downstream, so I did that. Came up to kind of log jam where huge logs and sticks were in the stream at once time, but left a sand bar, with a little creek. As I was preparing to jump down over the creek onto the sand I noticed a track, and it was bigger than mine I am 6 feet 8 with a size 15 shoe, this was about 19 inches. I measured it, I was like WTF, and scared at the same time, this wasn't normal, there were 5 tracks about 3 feet apart, then my hair on my head stared to raise. It gets worse. I walked back up the hill to the trails to tell my friend and right as I get on the trail I hear thug thug, kinda like when you stomp on the ground. I started walking faster, never looked back, and we don't camp that far up in the wild anymore, we go to like Hills Creek campground. Lol I felt I was in his area, and he wanted me to leave by the thug's noises, I was so scared, this kinda stuff never happens to people, only in books and movies. While deer hunting in the Jefferson Wilderness area, I took a stand on top of an old big tree stump which stood approximately 2 feet in height. It gave me a good view of an old growth forest tree line, approximately 100 yards in front of me, facing east. Between the tree line and myself was a clear cut. To my right side was a small hill with a ridge that extended up into the old growth forest. As I was standing on the stump with the sun setting, I still could make out antlers on a deer. I heard a loud burst of a whistle sound with a swirling pitch to my right side. As I looked to my right, approximately 75 yards away, midway up the hill stood a figure facing me attempting to get my attention. I noticed it stood upright with a large upper body and no visible neck. It was dark in color from head to foot. It stood approximately 6 to 7 feet tall. I saw no detail. It was dusk. As I thought about the situation, I thought, it must mistake me for something else. I was wearing a black jacket with the hood over my head, dark pants, and being on that stump making me look 7 to 8 feet tall. Neither it or myself moved for about 15 to 30 seconds, could have been a little longer. Then fear hit me. I got off the stump with rifle in hand, carefully and slowly walking out back to my truck with nothing following me. 
I have hunted this area many times in the past and know it fairly well. Walking on that particular hill or its ridge makes far too much noise for a hunter, due to all the small dead timbers, branches and bushes laying on the ground. Everything was quiet until this thing made that noise. I have been a hunter for over 20 years and know the wilderness and its sounds and its creatures very well. I've never had an experience like this. I told no one of what happened when I got back to camp, they would have teased me to no end. This encounter happened many years ago when I was 15 years old. I only recently started reading information on the internet describing this creature and now have a desire to tell my story. This encounter happened at my grandparents' lake cabin, south of the town of Danbury, Wisconsin, east of Highway 35, around Devil's Lake. My background has always been the great outdoors, playing and exploring in the woods. During this time period, I was very comfortable going out by myself, for all-day adventures. On the night of this encounter, I had gone to sleep around 10 p.m. It was in the summer, so no school. This night was warm, so I had the bedroom window slightly cracked for some air circulation and to hear the crickets and outside noises. This always would put me to sleep every time because like I said earlier, I was very comfortable in the woods and nothing was out of the ordinary that night. Now at the time, my grandparents' bedroom was on the other side of the cabin. They also had a black Labrador retriever that always slept in my room most of the time this fact will come into the story later on. I had fallen asleep like I always did at this cabin. Hours later, I never knew exactly what time it was but it was late and everyone was asleep. I suddenly awoke feeling something was wrong. Being still groggy, the first thing I noticed was that nothing outside was making any noise at all. No crickets, frogs, whippoorwills. Nothing but total silence. I held my breath for a minute, listening very intently, thinking that was very odd. I moved my head to see the door of the bedroom. The night light from the hallway was giving a slight glow and I could see that my grandparents' dog was not laying in his normal spot on the floor or any place in my room. I guess maybe two to three minutes had passed and then I heard it. A sound that to me sounded like a raccoon or some other animal scratching the outside of the cabin. This continued and my mind wondered what the heck could have been making that noise. It was still totally silent, except that scratching noise that began to move down the wall, closer to the window of the bedroom. So, I turned my attention to the window. It was very dark outside but I could still make out the slight silhouette of the trees and the branches up high. All at once, the scratching stopped. I strained to adjust my eyes and that's when it stepped out of the shadows and blocked out the view of the trees. It was huge. No animal I knew of or could envision was standing in my view. I couldn't make out any features of its body, but I could see the distinct ears of a canine on a large head. Then. I saw its eyes and was paralyzed with fear. It was hunched down, looking in the window. Its eyes were a glowing amber color and blinked every 10 to 15 seconds. My mind was racing. Can it see me? What's it going to do? What am I going to do? A chill went down my spine. I could hear it breathing. It let out an exhale that was deep, but not overly loud. Then, it began to sniff the air. I could hear it clearly, only being around 10 to 12 feet away from it. About 30 seconds elapsed which felt like forever to me, but looking back, it was not much time at all. The creature then began to show its teeth, almost like a grin of satisfaction that it had scared me so badly. Time stood still, then it stood up, off its haunches, erect like a man, and walked off, away from the window, in the direction of the lake. I knew this was my chance, so I jumped out of bed, into the hallway, away from the window and began to breathe heavy, because I think I held my breath for over two minutes. I looked into the living room and could see the dog standing totally still, in a rigid posture, hair standing on end, with a slight growl looking at the deck window. I turned to the hall closet and grabbed my 20 gauge shotgun and loaded it. It was only a single shot, but it was better than nothing. I thought to myself while I was trying to catch my breath. 
Then I realized, if it wanted to come into the house it could easily do it by breaking the glass on the deck patio. If it did that, I had no place to go, because I was trapped in between my bedroom and that patio window to my grandparents' room, where my grandfather had a deer rifle that I couldn't get to. I stood, waiting for around 5 minutes and nothing happened. The dog seemed to calm down and walked over to me and sat down wanting to get his head scratched. I thought about waking up my grandparents and telling them what I had seen, but at the time, didn't think they would believe me. After all, I couldn't believe it myself, so I calmed down and went back into my bedroom, pulled the covers off the bed and slept on the floor with the gun and dog, at the ready, in a half sleep for the rest of the night. This encounter had scared me so bad I didn't want to even get close to the window to close it all the way that night, for fear of that thing coming back. I waited until dawn before I closed and locked it. Once daylight was in full force, I went outside to see if I could find any scratches on the wall or anything else, like footprints. I didn't find anything at all and was starting to wonder if I was going crazy. No. That thing was real. I continued to sleep on the floor for around a week before I felt it was okay to sleep in my bed again, but that window stayed closed and locked ever since. I didn't have any other encounters with a dogman after that incident and the memory was put out of my mind over time until recently. I was reading encounters on your website and saw that two other people had an encounter in the same area as me. When I saw their encounters, I decided to share my experience. You don't know what true primal fear is until you see one of these things and are face to face with one. I never want to experience it again. While deer hunting an old clear cut, I took a stand on top of an old three feet high stump. There were some pine trees and high bush in this clear cut. About 150 yards across the clear cut was a tree line of an old growth forest. It was this tree line I was hoping to see deer come out of, as they frequently do in the evenings. I was wearing my black Columbia jacket, blue jeans and a hat. As I stood on this this stump for approximately one hour, I heard a loud swirling whistle sound to my right. On the bank of this ridge to my right stood a figure facing me, I could only make out its silhouette and that it looked hairy head to foot, could not make out its fine features. Hair was dark in color, standing upright, approximately 6 to 7 feet tall, wide shoulders and torso. This was no man. It was my impression it had mistaken me for something else, and tried to get my attention. I waited about 5 minutes watching to see what it would do. It just stood there watching me. I got down off the stump and walk out always glancing over my shoulder, it did not follow me. This incident really spooked me even with rifle in hand. I did not share this with my hunting party back at camp, knowing they would have teased me relentlessly. I am an avid hunter, and there are a lot of black bears in this era. This was no bear. First let me say that this is a true story. My friend called me to ask if I would stay at his property while he and his wife went back east to care for his ailing mother, about two weeks he asked. I said sure and I arrived on or about October 10, 2004 mid-afternoon. As soon as I arrived they left for the airport in Grant's Pass for their flight. I was left with directions on what to feed the chickens, goats, and pets. My friends had just moved onto this property a few weeks before, he had planted a large garden, cleared some forest land for a pasture and etc. at 6. M. The next morning, I walked out to the barn roughly a hundred yards from the house to feed the chickens and goats, and was surprised to see the goats in the back part of the pasture already as they had been locked in the barn the evening before. As I approached the barn door I suddenly found the door was open. The wood handle was over my head and height from the ground was in the up position. I looked into the barn and all I saw was a mess of chicken feathers everywhere, bloodly mess also. Not a single chicken was to be found just feathers so I backtracked out of the barn, there I noticed these huge human looking footprints, 5 toed and about 16 inches in length. These were leading off toward the river which was down over the bank through thick timber, 
and blackberry vines. I followed these tracks, which was not hard through the thickets, down to the river. There I was surprised again at finding a huge set of rocks stacked onto each other, about four feet high, with some chicken feathers laying about. I was then starting to get worried, and quickly got back to the barn, fed the goats, which were not bothered as far as I could tell. That day went by so quickly as I dreaded seeing the darkness of night come on. That evening I locked the goats in the barn, put a padlock on the handle, and settled in for a long night of thinking about what I had found that morning. I had already carried in the firewood enough to last all night, and was disturbed at the fact there was no curtains on any windows in their house. Anyone or anything could see inside the house if the lights were on. I left most of the lights off. I went into a back bedroom to email my friend to tell him about his chickens. I was sitting next to a corner window using the computer when suddenly a big, tall shadow walked directly by right in front of the window. I looked into the eyes of a creature roughly 8 feet tall, hair covered most of the body, full facial features were not clear in the moonlight, but was enough to scare me silly. I was quiet, kept the lights off, and heard this Bigfoot walk onto the deck outside. I went from room to room as quickly as I could to watch what he would do outside. I was armed with a .38 special, but no way I would have shot this creature with a small weapon as this. Finally after about 10 minutes he was gone, just walked back into the edge of the timber down toward the river. Next morning at daylight I was outside looking at these 16 inches tracks thinking about how heavy this creature had to be to leave tracks that were around an inch and a half deep in rather dry ground. This location is within 7 miles of the Oregon Caves National Park, where another Bigfoot was reported to be seen. My wife and I were driving back to our cabin we have in the North Woods, after visiting friends in town. It was a hot, muggy, summer night, but it was cooling down fast, which made it start to get foggy. The road went about a half mile, through a spruce bog, then up a hill, to where a farm field was, on the right. Hardwoods were on the left. I was in my mid-fifties at the time and did not believe in things like what we were about to see. Out of the fog, from the farm field, going from right to left, came a creature. The creature was about 8 to 10 feet off the ground. The best way to describe what we saw would be to say, it looked like a person who had jumped off a trampoline and took off with their arms stretched out, in front of them, with their legs bent. It was upright however and was covered all over with fur. It was not a coyote or wolf, but looked like a cross between a man and some kind of canine. It had pointy ears and a long snout. My wife later said the head reminded her of the ancient Egyptian god, with a dog head, but furry. It landed flat on its feet, directly in front of my wife's van, no more than 20 feet away. The craziest thing is, it landed and jumped like a kangaroo, flying back off, into the fog. Its arms were still sticking straight out, in front of it. It did not act or look like any canine we know of. We had been going slowly, because of the fog. As soon as she saw that thing, she stopped the van. We just looked at each other, like, did we really just see that? However, we did see it. And it still freaks us out, to this day. Another weird thing is, we both felt that it was not of this world. It did not move naturally and that was just the feeling we got. We don't tell many people about what we saw, because the people we have told don't believe or want to believe we saw what we saw. However, I did tell a good friend of mine, who didn't laugh, because he said, when he was a little kid, his father, who was a logger, used to tell him about loggers in the woods seeing dog man. I'm so glad I found this website. I see that other rational people have seen similar creatures. Like some others, I was with someone who witnessed it too. It must be really difficult for someone who sees one of these things, by themselves, to try and explain to others what they saw. The time was 2 or 3 in the morning I was taking my dog outside so he could, do, his job. I heard a gunshot next door I was wondering why there was a shot, then it stopped. 
Then, I heard a rumbling running through some trees. Then, the tree limbs were shaking a lot then I heard a loud scream, high pitch sound scared the crap out of me. Then, I looked up at a tree I saw these big eyes looking at me. It was all black, I knew it was something I did not hear before or see. I am sorry to say the place where it happened is burned down all the trees were cut down. On February 6, 2003, myself and two of my friends set out on a three-day hike that would take us from Cascade Locks at the Herman Creek Trailhead, up the Pacific Crest Trail, and into Wadham Lake. It was a 26.2-mile loop that we knew would take a few days to conquer. It was originally supposed to be a snowshoe trip, but the deepest the snow ever got was about 18 inches. For the month, we could not have asked for better weather. It was very cold, but there was not a cloud in the sky for any of the three days we were out. If anyone has ever been up in the area of Benson Plateau, Ruckle Creek, or Wadham Lake in the wintertime, they would also attest to there being nobody up there. We saw not a soul for three days, and there was nobody within miles. We reached our campsite the first day just as it got dark on Benson Plateau. The next morning we headed out for our ultimate destination, Wadham Lake. The night before we decided to empty out as much weight as we could in our packs and take only what we needed, for the faster we could get to the lake, the better we were assured of getting back to camp before dark. We emptied out some food and other various items, left them in our tent, and got our packs down to 30 to 35 pounds. We hiked the 5 miles to and around Mount Chinadier and into Wadham Lake. The three of us made it back to camp again just as the sun set. At around dusk, the winds on the plateau got very strong. The weather was already cold, about 25 degrees, and obviously the wind didn't help any. I read on Noah's homepage the next day that there were wind gusts from 40 to 60 miles per hour around where we were camped that night. I am going to estimate that with the wind chill, it was about 5 to 10 degrees that night. We were feeling pretty proud of ourselves for reaching our objective that night. We did what we went there to do, it was no picnic, and we were extremely happy that we did it. We knew that the next morning it was all downhill to the trailhead. So we made a nice fire, the wind helped us make a nice fire, even though it made it hard to start, made some dinner, and sat around laughing and talking around the fire, trying to keep warm. At around 9.30 we went into the tent, it was just too cold to stay outside anymore, and started playing cards for about a half an hour. We then shut out the light and laid down. My friend who was on the far right of the tent, farthest from me, was asleep when his head hit the pillow. But myself and my buddy who was in the middle sat it up for a while to shoot the breeze and tell a few jokes. I was right in the middle of a joke when, all of the sudden, there was what appeared to be a flashlight on the side of their tent farthest from me, the right side. This light was about 2 half minus 3 inches in diameter, had about 3 to 4 radials in it, and had about a 1 quarter inch diameter black spot in the middle much like a mag light at close range. It made a few circles around the tent, lasting about two to three seconds, then clicked off. We could not, however, hear it click off because the wind was blowing. Both my buddy and I saw the light, and it was unquestionably a light emitted from a bulb. There is no possible way that the light was created from a rolling log in the fire pit, or the moon showing through the trees, or anything of that sort. This was a round light from a flashlight or something of the sort as if coming from a krypton bulb. The two of us went from talking and laughing, to completely silent and 100% still. We whispered very quietly to each other to make sure that both of us just saw what we think we did. Not three seconds later, we heard crunching on the ground. Within 10 seconds of that, our fire went from being a warm orange glow, and flickered almost completely out. The previous night we had snow in the tree above our tent and the fire pit. It had melted off through the day, and where our camp was you could walk just 100 yards to the south and you would have been at the snow line. The ground around our camp was very hard, and it was covered in a sheet of ice. So, we left the fire going moderately, hoping that the next morning we would still have some warm coals to warm up with. 
In a matter of two seconds, our fire went from a steady orange glow, flickered a few times, and then went to a very weak reddish slash orange glow. Five minutes later, it was out and completely dark. My friend and I were, needless to say, very freaked out by the events that were taking place. We shook the third Maba of our party awake, and we realized that we had left a camp shovel, and a hatchet outside of the tent. We called out to see if anyone was out there, thinking maybe it was a lost hiker, or a forest ranger who was out patrolling the area for some odd reason. But nobody called back. We sat there and listened, and again heard pacing and footsteps outside of our tent. This was not a pitter-patter of a four-legged animal, or the pacing of a cougar or a bear. There was no sniffing, no sound other than pacing. And what's more, it was definitely a two-legged something that was doing this pacing. The sound it made was a continuous crunch, crunch, like a two-legged being walking on an icy ground. We decided that we should go outside without flashlights and see what was going on, and what was more, to get our hatchet and camp shovel back. My friend on the far right grabbed his flare gun, the only weapon we had inside the tent, and we all threw on our thermal boots and pants, and went outside in a hurry. We looked all around the tent, shining lights everywhere, but saw nothing. No tracks, no nothing. The ground was very hard, densely packed dirt and ice atop of it. With our packs on, each of us weighed over 220 pounds, and we did not make a single track up there. We were jumping up and down the next morning to see if we could make tracks, or imprints, but we could not. Also, we were on a plateau that was dense with trees. There were trees everywhere, plenty of places for something to hide. At this time I was thinking that some psychopath was on the loose, or somebody was fooling with us. But then I started to put two and two together. There we were, literally in the middle of nowhere, 5,200 feet up, 9 miles away from any sort of civilization, may as well have been 100, and the only two ways up to where we were was a steep 7-hour hike up Eagle Creek Trail, or a steeper 8-8-half-hour hike up PCT. We were in our thermal underwear, wool socks, thermal snow boots, waterproof insulated snow pants, undershirts, long-sleeve overshirts, and insulated North Face ski jackets, and we were freezing cold. There was no way, it was impossible, for any human being to survive up there that night without fire and or shelter, it just was not possible. If it just would have been a case of footsteps for a few seconds, a flashlight, and a fire that was put out, I might agree that there were some other hikers up there who just wanted to have a good time and mess with us. But after we went back into the tent, we heard the footsteps again. This time, they went from near the fire pit, and walked over to the tent, past where our feet were pointed, and went over to my side of the tent. There, whatever it was paced and paced for about an hour and a half. This threw out any notion in my head that it was a human being, it just was not physically possible for a person to be up there and live without shelter for this period of time. I myself am a cold weather fanatic, I love cold weather. But I was never so cold as I was on that trip on that night, it was extremely cold and windy out. There was never any sniffing or any other clanging around of objects you would hear from any animal. Plus, whatever it was, we scared it off twice, and it came back. What kind of animal gets scared off, or runs off, and continuously comes back, only to get closer? What is also more, obviously, is what kind of animal has a flashlight. I have had to tell myself yeah, but Bigfoot doesn't have a flashlight, but then I think, well, we really don't know how intelligent they are. If a monkey can fly into space. When we got back into our sleeping bags, my friend who was sleeping, the one that did not see the light, tried to convince himself it was just some animal for the sake of being able to sleep. The next day he admitted that he knew that whatever it was had two legs. My other friend and I agreed to try and stay awake for as long as we could, maybe take turns on a watch. It had been such a long trip, and such a physically demanding one, this was hard to do no matter how scared we were. After my one buddy dozed off, my other friend that had agreed to stay awake with me dozed off and both started to snore. 
Tay pacing continued for nearly 45 minutes, not more than 7 feet from the tent, and there was nothing else. No sounds, no calls, no grunts, nothing. It was very strange feeling, but I almost felt like whatever it was, was waiting for me to sleep. Even though I made no sound at all, it felt like something knew I was awake, and was waiting for me to sleep. I decided to rip off a few fake snores to see what would happen, just out of curiosity. After my third snore, the flashlight appeared again on the right side of the tent. Again, it made three or four circles. I woke up my friend who was next to me hastily. As soon as I did so, the light went off, and the walking outside of the tent stopped. This time I got a really good look at the light, as there was no orange glow from the fire outside the tent. It was completely pitch black dark outside, and this light came from literally nowhere. We awoke my other friend, and we all talked and agreed that it had not yet messed with the tent, it hadn't moved it or anything, and was not threatening us yet. Plus, none of us knew if we really wanted to rush outside this time. We all knew that somehow this time whatever it was would not run away, and we may then be in a world of hurt. So we laid there in our tent for a while, trying to stay awake but unable to. After about 10 to 15 more minutes, the pacing ceased and all there was was the wind. I tried to stay awake to see if whatever it was would come back, but I could not. When we awoke the next morning, the only thing that was disturbed was the fire. It was slightly wet, like someone had thrown snow on it and it also had a mixture of ash and dirt on top of it. Again, all the snow in the tree had melted and fallen off by the second day, so there is no way the snow came from the tree. Otherwise, no tracks, nothing molested or disturbed, no nothing. There was no smell or odor at any time during our occurrence or anything else. We quickly picked up camp that cold morning, and headed back down quickly and safely. I have no idea if what this was was Bigfoot. I really do not know for sure if this was Sasquatch, or some other phenomena. I do know this, it definitely had two legs, and it was not a human. I guess I am just looking for some insight, some sort of feedback on what this may have been. So far, Bigfoot has been my best guess. Something else unusual that I did not even think of until about three weeks after the trip, on our way back to camp from Wadham Lake, about two miles past Mount Chinadir, we all three heard a strange call that sounded like a cross between a moose and an elk. I thought it was just me, but then not two seconds later my friend, who is from Colorado, said they don't have moose in Oregon, do they? I asked him if he heard it too, and they both said they thought they heard what sounded like a moose, or a cross between a moose and an elk. It was a low-pitched, but very powerful cooing noise, probably coming from a ways off. We were pretty high up, and it was really cold out there, and snowy where we were when we heard it. Maybe it was just an elk, I'm not sure, but it just seemed strange for an elk to be out and about at that time and place. Any insight on this? from anyone, would be appreciated. I do also know that there have been a few sightings around this area from Herman Creek to Ruckle Creek, and any info would be useful. It is difficult to talk about sometimes, and I try not to think about what it was or may have been when I am alone. I would like to come to some sort of conclusion on this so I can put it to rest. We were walking around Don's elk ranch. Then all of a sudden all of the elk started running around frantically. Me and my friend thought it was a cougar or something. We sat there for 20 minutes at least. Every one of the elk were looking back at where they came from. Which I thought was really weird. Then all of a sudden I swear to god I saw it. I swear to god, Bigfoot it was a hairy ape, man looking thing. It was about 8 to 8, 6 foot tall very muscular and walked on its hind legs. It was walking in a fast pace like it needed to be somewhere in a hurry. I grabbed my shotgun and shot two in the air. It ran straight for the brush and we never seen it again. The smell of the thing smelt like Hannes garbage and shit mixed together. When I fired the first shot it picked up a big rock and flung it at us. Too bad we were 100 yards away. He came pretty close to hitting us. 
That's when I laid down the law. I piped another shell and laid it right on him. That's when he took off. That's then last I seen of him or her. This happened to me when I was 10 or 11. I'm just about to turn 20 now, but I'll never forget what happened that day. I was at my grandparents' house, who were watching me for the day. They live out, in a mixture of farmland and woods, in rural Wisconsin. Their yard is mostly surrounded by farmland, but to the right side of the yard is a couple acres of woods and a swamp. It was a really hot, muggy morning, in July. I was standing out on the deck, shooting at some cans, with my BB gun. All of a sudden, I got the sense something was wrong. It felt like I was being watched. I started scanning the tree line and down at the edge of the trees, about 60 yards away, by the swamp slash woods was this thing, standing, that I can only describe as a dog man. It was about 7 feet tall, covered with shaggy gray hair, had the classic dog man face, long snout, pointed ears on top of head, yellow eyes, and it was very muscular. It was standing on two legs, but it appeared to be sort of leaning up against a tree. We locked eyes and while it was probably only 10 seconds, it felt like hours. It sounds silly, but I felt the thing had a sinister grin on its face. It was extremely intimidating. I know that had that thing wanted to kill me, it easily could have done that. I could relive this encounter, at my age now, with a shotgun, instead of a BB gun, and I'd still be just as terrified as I was then. It definitely had a very negative and sinister vibe to it. After locking eyes with the thing, it just bolted off on two legs, through some of the swamp and emerged farther down the tree line, and then ran off, into the forest. At first, I thought it might have been one of my older cousins, playing a joke on me, who lived nearby, but then I realized, there was no way they could be wearing a suit, be seven feet tall, and clear the swamp as fast as that thing did. I wasn't gonna tell grandma and grandpa I saw a werewolf, down by the swamp, they'd never believe me. So, I just kept my mouth shut and tried to carry on with my day there. Well, later that afternoon, I was talking to my aunt and she brought up the fact that she had heard strange noises the night before. When I asked what they sounded like, she said it was a lot of snarling, and growling, and it kind of sounded like an animal being attacked. My neighbor's friend, who lives far far up Rocky Point Road came over to my neighbor's house the other day all shooken up. My neighbor's son was the one that told me this story. Apparently my neighbor's friend was driving down Rocky Point Road some time that morning, I got the impression that it was early in the morning, and a ape-like person, only 4 or 5 feet tall ran across the road, I am guessing on 2 feet and then grabbed the top of the bank on one side of the railroad and pulled the rest of its body up and swung his legs under his arms and pushed itself into a run and it ran off into the woods. I didn't get a very good description of what he thought it looked like, except that it was about 4 to 5 feet tall and had long arms. My neighbor told me that a few other people who live up there have seen the exact same thing. My neighbor, I'm not sure how long ago, also saw this thing which he described was around 4 feet tall and had an et like, from the movie, monkey face, with long arms and short legs, I think he might have said it was black or brownish, but I'm not sure. He saw it about 500 feet from where his friend saw it. I am planning on going up there with a friend or two and just hanging out with a camera in hopes of catching evidence of it or just finding out what it is. I think this is something definitely worthy of a small investigation even though it doesn't sound like the normal 8 to 10 foot tall Bigfoot sighting. You should talk to my neighbor on the phone at least and get some other people's numbers who might have more information. Hello, I've been taking walks on the park 20 kilometers away from my home. It's surrounded by mountains and a very wide walking trail is in the middle with also a road for cars. I take my runs there sometimes and a few weeks ago I saw a bald man with a very interesting face, blue drawn eyes, around 55 to 60 years old, 
black coat and a very correct walk like Hess some aristocrat or something. He seemed very interesting dude but I paid no more attention and forgot it. One week later I took a walk with my girlfriend and I see this man coming in our path, we cross paths and he says good afternoon, I say it back and continue. My GF also stated that he looks creepy and I told her Hess probably just being polite. Note in my country no one says hello without knowing you so it was kinda odd. Now we've been joking about what if this guy turns out to be something non-human and all that, but I really didn't think much of it. This week I took a walk at night with my girlfriend and we were walking besides the main trail in a higher trail like 5 meters away and I see him walking down an opposite path and out of nowhere has staring at me and starts coming up, I tell my girl look it's that guy and she freaks out, I kinda do too, we continue walking and we turn our back but he hasn't climbed. We go down to the main trail and see Hess still walking his way and we continue our walk then go home. Just the other night I had a thought about that guy climbing his way out to us in the walking park and it turned to reality. Now I don't expect people to know what exactly is the thing with this guy but just wanted to talk about it. Maybe we are judging him and nothing is wrong with him but his face is just so odd and his energy too, it's not that I felt threatened by it but just creeped. A close friend of mine, who I trust is telling the truth, recently shared a story with me. I'm a huge skeptic of anything supernatural, but I can't come up with a logical explanation for this one, and I'm wondering what you all make of it. A long while back, he was in a car crash. He was not inebriated at the time, and he was the only person in the car. After the crash, he was able to unbuckle the seatbelt, and get himself out of the car. He immediately went to medical services to get checked out. They got ready to do an x-ray, and when he removed his shirt, he had two bruises, in the clear shape of hands. One was on his left shoulder, the other on his right hip. The way they were positioned, it's as if someone grabbed him hard from behind and pulled him into the seat. The marks were so visible that the doctor examining him immediately asked if there was someone else in the car with him because he was convinced they were made by someone grabbing him from behind. At the time, my friend was very religious and explained it as a religious miracle, saving him in that crash. Since then, he's been disillusioned from the church, but still cites this as one of his primary pieces of evidence that something supernatural could be out there. But he has an open mind. I got his permission to post this, and he's curious what you have to offer as a possible explanation. Any ideas? In the spring of 2009, I was driving through central Wisconsin from Minneapolis to my home in northern Michigan on Highway 64 between Gilman and Medford. I had been seeing deer on the road since St. Croix. So I was driving slowly and on high alert. At the farthest reach of my high beams, I saw something walking across the road. I slowed way down to about 30 miles per hour and that's when I saw it. Now here is the weird part I saw the back of it as it was jumping over the steel barrier. It was bipedal, had legs that resembled a moose and ears like a dog, but no tail, it had to have been 7 to 8 feet tall. I think I almost swallowed my tongue. I came to a T in the road about a half hour later. Right at the T, there is a bar, it was open, and I needed a drink. Just a shot I was driving after all. I must have had a wild look on my face because I just sat down at the end of the bar. And asked for a shot of anything. When the bartender poured me a shot of JD, he said, you just saw it, didn't you? I didn't say a word. I just looked at him. He said, this one is on the house. I drank the damn shot, put five dollars on the bar, and left. I never mentioned it to anyone else until now. Today me and my mom went to my mom's friend's cottage in a remote area to bury her pet bearded dragon that was stored in her freezer for like three months. She was a beloved pet and she had wanted to bury her earlier but her brother wanted to dig the hole so she had to wait because he lives in another province and he owns the property. 
While her brother was digging he actually claims to have found the foundation of the first house in the area where the whole family died in a fire. They, my mom and her friend, were kind of scared that was bad juju or something but did it anyways. Previously, her brother found artifacts like coins from the 18th century and children's bones, according to him. I believe him on the coins but am skeptical about children's bones. Is it bad juju to bury a pet in a place that could be haunted? I didn't feel or see any haunted stuff while there or have anything bad happen to me. We read the rainbow bridge and told her we would meet her again one day. I felt like she was at peace slash in a better place. She died at age 14 and didn't want to eat or drink any more near the end. I burned sage the whole time and it burned so hot we had to put it in the fire pit. I saw something in the fire pit that looked like a cross between a cacomissile with a lemur's face. Its body was kind of cat-like. It was striped but smoke-colored, like the sage smoke, but then it suddenly disappeared. It seemed obviously spectral to me. It didn't seem like a bad or ominous spirit. What could it have meant? If it had a meaning. My family and I were recently on a trip in Glasgow. We stayed in this fantastic hotel that had obviously been around a while, lots of plaques and photos of famous people who had stayed, etc. The first night, I woke up, though not abruptly really, to what I can only describe as a presence. I heard distinctly and by that I mean somehow the words entered my brain but it wasn't quite a voice per se someone say, I'm watching you. But it wasn't scary at all somehow. It was absolutely matter of fact. I don't have any other experiences like this and I've always thought of myself as a big scaredy cat, so I have no idea how I fell back to sleep. Not only that, I woke up the next day feeling great and didn't even remember to tell anyone. The morning following the next night, my mom, who was sharing the room with me, says at breakfast, you all aren't going to believe me but I swear someone was in our room last night. I remember thinking, just be still and let them finish whatever they're doing. Needless to say, this jogged my memory and I relayed my experience. The fact that we had two independent experiences in the same room kinda confirms for me that something is in that hotel. I asked the staff right before we left and they kinda smiled and said, not sure but you're not the first to mention this. My husband and I frequent a local weekly farmer's market. We generally start up at the top building so he can run to use the bathroom. I stand patiently outside and wait. I am a anxious and empathetic person so I try to just keep to myself as I wait. So I'm just standing there probably staring at the floor or something and this guy comes out of the bathroom and just stands beside me. Hmm okay whatever. I look up and he looks at me and says going to be a full moon tonight said something else about luck and I just kinda stood there looking at him. Husband comes out of the bathroom and we head off. A short while later this man and another man walk by. The man who spoke to me earlier looked my way said something to the other guy I couldn't catch then said I'd know her anywhere. Okay next up I travel a lot and we like to visit odd places. We stopped at this radio place a older woman walked people through. Her husband had collected them and had passed away. There was a smaller shed building and then a garage. I had gone in the shed just a moment then left my husband to go back to the truck. After a short while him and the woman came out of the shed. She walked over to me with hands cupped. Kinda shyly and said she had a gift for me. I said oh yeah. A gift? And put my hands out in front of her where she placed a beaded Christmas spider. She didn't really say much other than there's info online about them. I got out of the truck to follow them along in the garage. I had the gift in my hand. I swear when I walked through that garage I felt all these tiny little spider web threads tickling my legs and arms. I was brushing at my leg as though to well brush it away. No one else seemed to notice. Even after going back outside I had mentioned it to my husband. He brushed me off like I did the webs.
So I know this is gonna sound weird and ridiculous but the craziest thing happened at Walmart today that kinda freaked me out for a while. So me and my girlfriend go to Walmart pretty frequently. It's cheap and sometimes they have really cool Disney and anime shirts and stuff that we like and it's only 5 minutes from our house. So she told me she was gonna check the women's clothes to see if they have any biker shorts while I was gonna go to the men's section to see if they had any new anime or Disney shirts. We decided I would just meet back with her since the registers are right in front of the women's clothes and then we would go. When I was done checking the men's stuff I see my girlfriend walking towards the food section and in my head I was wondering why she was going there, so I started following her to catch up to her and I see her suddenly turn left, so I ran and turned left and no one was there. It was an empty aisle and I was kinda confused so I ran some more looking for her thinking she was messing with me and maybe went to the next aisle and legit there wasn't anybody near there and I was confused on where she would have gone. So I decided to just call her up and I said hey where are you and why did you go to the food aisle? I told you I'd meet back up with you in the women's clothes and she said I am in the women's clothes? I've been in the same spot? Immediately I said I just saw you walk here referring to the section I'm at and she was really confused. I ran towards the women's section and found her and told her what happened and what I saw and she said maybe I mistook someone else for her, but my girlfriend is a pretty distinct girl. She's 5 feet 9 and has really long blonde hair and is decked out completely in Disney. She was definitely weirded out but kinda just shrugged it off but honestly I have no clue what happened. I was only like 7 feet from her when she turned the aisle and I don't think she would have made it all the way down to the next aisle by the time I turned into it. And I ran around the entire vicinity looking for her because I thought it was weird. She was legit trying on clothes when I met back up with her at the women's section. Who the F did I see? Or what was it? The fact this happened at Walmart of all places is weird in itself but it really did freak me out. Edit, I know people are gonna think oh you just saw someone who looked like your girlfriend but she was wearing something very specific, a Disneyland jersey which you get only from the park with Disney Crocs. We live in a retirement town near a res in the valley so not many 5 feet 9 blonde girls decked out in Disney here. Plus the girl I saw disappeared basically into thin air so even if it was a girl who looked like my girlfriend still was weird as f. I couldn't believe my eyes as I stared at the lifeless body of my sergeant. He had taken his own life in the police station and left behind a note with coordinates. I knew I had to investigate. The coordinates led to a remote part of Yellowstone National Park. I knew it was a long shot, but something compelled me to follow through. I set out on the long drive to the park, unsure of what I would find. When I arrived, I met a park ranger who told me that the area I was headed to was off limits to visitors. I knew I had to be careful, so I lied and told him I was just there to do some hiking. He reluctantly let me pass, but warned me to stay on the designated trails. As I hiked deeper into woods, the smell of rotting flesh grew stronger. I knew I was getting close to something, but I had no idea what it could be. Suddenly, I saw a cave in the distance. My heart raced as I approached it, unsure of what I would find inside. As I neared the entrance, a terrifying creature emerged. It had the body of a man but the head of a dog. It let out a roar that sent shivers down my spine. I reached for my gun but my hands were shaking so badly that I missed my target. The creature charged at me, tackling me to the ground. I struggled to get free, but it was too strong. I was certain that I was going to die. Just as I thought it was over, the creature let out a final roar and ran off into the woods. I lay there for what felt like an eternity, trying to catch my breath. When I finally stood up, I knew I had to get out of there. I stumbled back to the park ranger, my mind racing with what had just happened. You're insane, the park ranger said, when I told him about the creature. There's no such thing as dogmen. But I knew what I had seen. And from that day on, I couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister was lurking in the woods, waiting for its next victim. I never forgot about that encounter, and I never went back to that part of the forest again. I knew that some things were better left alone.
There was a time when I thought that my life would be boring and mundane. Every day I'd get up, go to work, and then come home and take a nice shower before going to bed. Then one day, that all changed. Right after my youngest daughter started high school, my wife got a job in another state and we moved without much warning. And my daughter also changed school, so she wasn't around very often either. I remember how alone I felt until this day came when something called me from the darkness outside of town. It was about 1 am when, at first, I thought it was nothing more than a raccoon rummaging through the trash cans outside the house. Suddenly, from behind me, I appeared this very chiseled humanoid creature, standing well over 7 feet tall with matted black hair. I don't know what it was looking for, but I can tell you that I almost had a heart attack when it turned around to face me with these glowing eyes. After what felt like an eternity of standing there in complete shock at the sight of this thing, it looked to me for about 5 seconds before disappearing. I would consider this creature a chupacabra and based on what I've seen online and how this creature looked. After this, I started drinking every night and didn't stop until years later when I finally moved back to my hometown. To this day, I still think about this creature often, wondering if he's still out there somewhere lurking in the darkness, just waiting for another unsuspecting victim to pounce upon. I believe that would have been me had I been maybe in my full uniform. I was off duty at the time, so who knows. It's signings like this that make me wonder if all my years as an officer in service have really gotten to me. Maybe change the way my brain feels and works. Maybe I've gathered hallucinogenic PTSD from everything I've gone through because since then I've never seen anything quite like what I saw, but I can't help but feel that this was more than real and I didn't just have a vision. This was real. This was something that actually happened to me. I feel like if I had my radio or weapon on me, I would have taken a shot at this thing. Could it have been a demon? I don't know. I'm really not sure exactly what this was. But he opened his door and got out too and we both stood staring at this creature for several minutes. When he began to move towards away from us at incredible speed, I turned back towards the cruiser only to realize that my partner was no longer there. I was about to radio for backup when I heard a scream coming from the wood line. Just then more silence. I didn't know what to do, so I just stood there where I was until backup had arrived. Once it did, we immediately set out into the woods to try and find my partner who had been missing for nearly an hour at this point. It was dark and quiet, an uncomfortable silence that now settled over us as we searched desperately. Then I saw it, the most notable legend the goat man darting through the tree several yards ahead of us. But after a few seconds it stopped, looking back at me like it knew I'd seen him. The only thing I could do was stand there in complete horror as this creature stared right back at me with its glowing eyes before it sought out to attack. Right before I felt his hands on me, my vision went black. I woke up to find myself strapped to a hospital bed with nobody else around. I've been here for the past few days now and haven't seen any of my fellow officers. I'm hoping to be released soon, the doctors are being very dodgy about it, saying they have more tests to run on me before they can sign me out. What could all of this mean and where did my fellow officer go? As a cop, I have a few supernatural encounters to share with you. Not exactly sure how related they are to the supernatural, but I can tell you the night in question it was very hot. Our police radio started going crazy with calls for an officer down in the northern section of the city. We all quickly headed out there to this call. When we arrived, there were already multiple patrol cars at the scene outside this unoccupied warehouse. There was blood all over the ground. One of our officers had been shot in the chest. Luckily for him, that his vest had saved him from dying. He was unsteady on his feet and can barely stand up due to how much pain he was in. After getting an ambulance, we sent him off. Once we got his vest off, we could see he had a very bad wound. We later found out that another officer had died at the scene after being shot by a shooter who fled into the warehouse. This leads to my supernatural encounter that I witnessed with one of my fellow partners who went inside. 
I stayed outside looking for any signs of the suspect and suddenly all of our radio started going crazy again. Haywire and wacky but instead of my dispatcher coming over it was just crazy amounts of static. This would actually happen to all of us. We would later find out from reporting to each other. After a few more minutes of standing outside doing some searching, I began to hear more radio static and scratchy noises to my radio receiver. Then I began hearing my partner screaming from inside the warehouse. I bolted in looking for any signs and all the lights inside the warehouse in unison shut off. I pulled out my mag light and began searching around. I could still hear him screaming upstairs, so I started shouting his name trying to look for the stairwell. I found it going up the stairs to the third floor where I'm sure I heard his screams. Now, I just need to stop the story here for just a second and explain this story that I'm about to share with you. It doesn't sound like any normal story you'd probably hear. I'm sure you get a lot of stuff, but as an officer, I don't ever want to share anything that's so out of the realm of reality that I would get laughed at. So, I have to tell you that what I saw next, I have no explanation for. I cannot rationalize this or explain it away with normal logic. So, as I'm running up there, I entered the third floor and I could still hear screaming, but as I came around the corner, I found a deceased person which I believe was the shooter. They were unidentified and looked to be like a male in his early 30s. He was in a pool of blood and his weapon was not far from him. I quickly checked to see if he was responsive, but he had no pulse. It was right here after this that I felt this overwhelming sensation of being watched. Although thoroughly checking all around me, there was no signs of anybody and I could still hear my partner wailing in the distance. It must have been on the next floor, so I quickly run back to the stairwell and run up to the fourth floor. Of course, his screams and wails go completely silent and I could hear something big moving around on this floor. Thinking it was the person probably keeping him quiet or pinned down perhaps, I drew my gun, yelling out, shining it in every which direction. I didn't see anything or see any blood or signs that anybody would be up here. I kept calling my partner's name, yelling, hoping they would respond. And just then, I heard something large coming towards me, approaching me from the side where my view was obstructed. As I turned to respond to the noise, I see this large black figure with pointed ears coming right at me. Out of reaction, I fire and this doesn't stop it. So now, I turn and run. I get to the stairwell and this thing is gaining on me. I get down to the stairs and I go down three, two, one and I'm now on the bottom level. I hear this thing start to come down the stairwell. It is incredibly large and keep in mind the entire time this has happened. I did not stop to turn around and identify what my sealant was or who they were from the vague shape that I saw that it came after me. It was not human nor was it animal. I can't exactly describe what or who it was. I fled out of the warehouse building, turned around and radioed for dispatch. I still could not find my partner and I needed backup. Now, within three minutes, Four to five black SUVs pull up and about 16 to 20 of these soldiers comes out and began storming the warehouse. They were all black and they were a branch of military that I did not quite recognize. Several secret agent looking men surrounded me, telling me that I no longer have jurisdiction over this case and I need to leave now or risk being detained. I explained to them to show me their badges who they were and that I was an officer of the county and that one of my men was. They interrupted me telling me that I either risk being detained or leave now. So I start arguing with the guy and my sheriff comes up right behind me, explaining to me that the case is now out of our hands and we need to let these guys take over. So I pull my shirt to the side, asking who are these guys, what are they doing here, and where is our partner? After shooting down all my questions, he just sends me home without really much information at all. I get that this story is very anticlimactic, but I'm actually hoping that sending this to you, you can give me any sort of hint as to what has happened. Is this normal for anything like this to happen? Did I encounter something from another world? Was this a ghost? And who were these men in the SUVs? Were they some sort of secret military branch or was this some form of the police that I was never made known about? 
Any help from your end would be greatly appreciated since I'm sure this falls under the realm of paranormal. Thank you. First off, let me state for the record that I do believe Bigfoot exists. I'm not huge into UFOs or aliens, but I know what I saw. I live in Louisiana and one night after midnight, I was on my way back to town from a catfishing trip before sunrise. My wife and kids were in the car and we were headed west out of the swamps right before you get to New Iberia. Right off of 837 before you hit the bridge, there's this old overgrown railroad track that runs alongside the road for about a hundred yards. It crosses the highway and dead ends, so no traffic is on there at night. As we drove down the two-lane highway, me and my wife were discussing getting some crawfish together when suddenly something large ran across where we had just been only what seemed like milliseconds ago. It literally crossed all eight lanes of traffic in a second. The only way I can describe what we saw was this tall, gangly white gorilla looking thing with super long arms and legs. It didn't appear to have much muscle but moved so fast it was surreal. And yet, when you looked at its head, it looked like a regular person, although this is because it moved so quickly. Now, this thing was propelling itself across the road due to how fast it was going, the same way a gymnast would be doing a backflip over a vault or a high bar. From what I could see, it was pale white. What was so bizarre was its skin color, the texture, and its fold of skin kind of like an elephant skin, maybe more closely to hog skin. That may have been the only thing that actually made me realize what I saw, because when you look at any other animal skins, it's not like this one. Anyway, I'm still shook up over this whole thing because how could something like this exist? It didn't exactly appear to be an ape hybrid either. Well, I mean apes aren't white. This is what immediately brought back the memories of seeing these things for the first time. As an officer, I'd like to have the answers myself, but I have no idea. I'm not really sure what these creatures are or what they're truly capable of. Maybe they can mimic us, maybe they are smart enough to use tools, or maybe just hunt us for food. To me, these things are something I'll never forget. You don't think you're ever going to see anything like this in your life, but then it happens right in front of you sitting right there. I know that everybody will say I'm lying because of how crazy it sounds, but it's true. These things are out there and if they wanted to attack us, I have no doubt they would be able to so easily. I should also mention that it appeared more interested in terrifying us than anything else. I'm sorry if the descriptions of these things that I've given you have sucked because it happened so fast. I can't exactly tell you what it was that we saw. My wife and I are still kind of flabbergasted at the sighting of this thing, even though this is not the first time I've seen it. But both times, or I should say several times I've seen it, I've never quite been able to get a good look at it. This could very well be a mutated animal or it could be an experiment released by scientists. I don't know. Those are just theories and speculation. You seem to be an expert on all things paranormal, strange, and cryptids, which this very well could be. Encrypted, although I must admit, I don't know much about cryptozoology. If I do, I figured you would be the expert to go through. So, what do you think this could be? I'll go ahead and insert that I don't think it was exactly a Bigfoot. I've actually heard of many Bigfoot encounters around here, for my witnesses and the creature they described does not at all fit the descriptions of what my wife and I saw that evening or the same creature I've seen by myself. Bigfoots are generally much more bulkier, kind of resembling front linemen on a football team cone-shaped heads with no neck, hulking bulky bodies. This thing looked like a little chimpanzee or something except longer, ganglier limbs, all white and moving with incredible speed and force. I'm at a complete loss of what that could be. Cop here. I had another officer at work meet up with me right after a call he was on. He said an elderly lady was insisting someone was getting into her mobile home and stealing things and moving them around when she was asleep or not home. This is the standard MO for dementia calls, 
They will insist but the facts don't add up and after talking to them for a while you start to realize they aren't all there, well. She had called us before and was advised by the officer to take some measures to prevent it or disprove it which she obliged. She screwed all her windows shut, changed the locks on the doors, and installed cameras inside. She even set an alarm with motion detectors in the house and slept in her locked bedroom where she could arm and disarm from there without leaving the bedroom. And she said they were still getting inside the home. So the first thing I think at this part of the story is that it has to be dementia because how the hell would they get in now? That, or it's like those horror stories where a person is living in your attic. She has no attic though so that's out. Well he reviews the video and you can see her leave and lock the front door. Then sure as shit someone's hand can be seen in the edge of one of the frames inside the home. He said after seeing that he tore the place apart, inside and out, but there was no way in or out, no signs of forced entry, and nothing missing from the home. He said he ended up not taking a report because he couldn't figure out how to write one without saying it was a ghost. I'm a Coast Guard, Old Navy tug, brought into service to the USCG Ice Treaker. Had a ghost of a Navy guy who died in the bilge from gas. Fast forward to a new USCG mechanic trying to fix one of the batteries, and wasn't getting it quite right. A guy on the batter next to him said, no you do it like this, and unscrewed a part, showing him how it was done. However the other guy was in a Navy uniform and we were at sea, he diapered shortly after talking. Lots of us had seen that Navy engineer in the past but that particular coast he got off the boat at the next port call and refused to reboard. We left without him, not sure whatever happened but he never came back to the ship. We also had the screams of a lady that would happen during late shifts. Enough that we always turned the boats aft away from the direction of the screams in case it was a civilian in the water, no woman aboard this ship. We would light up that section of ocean with high-powered lighting but there was never anything there. We were told not to log the events. One time we paddled into a backcountry site that we like camping at in the fall. It's high on a rocky cliff but is natural stairs up, so it's nicely protected from the wind and damp of the lake. One day we were walking around in the woods behind the site just to see what we see. There are lots of open spaces caused by exposed rock that create a natural trail. We weren't even that far from the site. All of a sudden we hear a short, low growl. We freeze. Neither of us were sure we actually heard it. We wait a minute, see and hear nothing, so we start walking again. A longer growl. Now the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. My instinct is to run, but I don't want to activate some animal's prey drive. We still don't see anything. My husband picks up a big stick and starts hitting trees and making lots of noise so we seem big. We slowly back away and walk calmly back to our campsite. Needless to say, we didn't sleep much that night. We never saw what it was, but our theory is that it was a coyote. We often hear them howling and yipping near there and I've read they sleep in the open during the day. We pull into a state park campground to camp for a couple of nights. There was a line of trees separating our campsite from our neighbors, and our neighbors had a strap strung up between two of the trees with two blackened sausages hanging from hooks. Trying to ignore how weird that is, our neighbors greet us and say don't worry about the sausages, our buddy got a trail camera so we're trying to catch raccoons with it. Glossing over the fact that this trail cam is pointed right into our campsite. I definitely had to keep this in mind when I got out of my camper to pee in the middle of the night. The sausages were still there the next morning, but I think eventually a ranger came by and told them to cut it out because they disappeared sometime during the day. I didn't like the weird vibes emanating from that spot so we just ignored their presence for the most part. They were gone for most of the day, but came back to their enormous RV and generator right as we were thinking it would be peacefully quiet for the rest of the evening. The last morning, I wake up to the sound of a thousand crows circling us. 
I lay there for a while and then peek out and see a dead crow lying right in the same precise spot below where those black sausages had been hanging the day before. Every crow within a 100 mile radius was circling overhead, angrily cawing out during this crow funeral. Now I've been on the wrong side of a crow war before, so I wasn't too interested in any of them recognizing me. We packed up our camp as quickly as we could and hit the road. In the early 90s we were backpacking through Copper Canyon in Chihuahua, Mexico. We were super tired and a little lost so just bivouacked next to a river in some smooth rocks. They were really perfect for sleeping on. My friend and I have our bags maybe 10 feet apart and we chat a little about the day as we drift off. No dinner, no fire. This is a very remote area. A few hours later we both awake to loud drum banging and 5-7 Tarahumara Indians running right through our campsite, screaming and banging their drums. Sort of dancing and chanting. Super cliche. Right between my friend and I. The moon had come out over the canyon and was super bright and I could see the expressions on their faces as clear as day. And as quickly as they appeared, they were gone. Off into the canyon. We just stared at each other without saying a word for about 5 minutes. I then reached over to my pack and fumbled around for a pint of cheap whiskey I'd been saving. Took a long pull off of it and then tossed it to my friend. We polished it off. Later we found out that the Tarahumara are super friendly and were probably just playing a prank on us. They're usually super shy. That was a long wait till sunrise though. Edit. This is not an area that I'd advise anyone to go without a guide these days. Also exercise extreme caution. It's unfortunately pretty cartelish back in there now. A few years ago, I loaded a bunch of camping gear onto my bicycle and spent the better part of the next 7 months riding 5,300 miles, 8,500 kilometers, around the western US. I did this trip solo. At night, I most often preferred to wild camp, simply finding somewhere to disappear into the woods, somewhere people were unlikely to find me and even less likely to care that I was there. The forest doesn't exactly make for a quiet night's sleep, but after the first few weeks, I found comfort in that. The constant droning of thousands of crickets and toads was all but a certainty. It was always a highlight of my night. Though not particularly uncommon. To hear the yips and howls of a distant pack of coyotes, and I fondly recall one evening I set up camp right between a pair of owls who spent much of the night hooting back and forth. If nothing else, it wouldn't take much of a breeze to stir music from the tree canopy. In late September, I'd found my way to western Montana. I was in a quite remote part of the state, and had little trouble finding a place to set up camp on this particular night. As I went through my usual evening routine, pitching the tent, writing the day's final journal entry, and so on, I didn't notice anything unusual. Once I turned out my light and laid down in bed, though, I came to a disturbing realization. It was dead silent. There was not a single cricket chirping, certainly no coyotes. There was no babbling of a nearby creek, and even the air between the dry leaves of early autumn still clinging to the trees was at a standstill. It was truly and completely silent. And that was terrifying. I can only describe it as the loudest silence I've ever heard. It felt as though the entire forest was trying to hide from something, like an equally silent predator. Suddenly the occasional snapping of a twig a common sound normally lost in the cacophony of other noises, rang out like a gunshot. I slept terribly that night, and I'll never forget the immense relief I felt with the first bird song of the pre-dawn hour. My sister solo hiked the Pacific Crest Trail a couple years back. One night, on the southern portion near a hot spring that was accessible from a nearby road, she woke up to screaming. A couple she'd soaked with in the spring had been tripping on something, and the guy OD'd after she went to sleep. 
She told me another time she was cowboy camping in Northern California and brushing her teeth after dark. Heard a large animal moving around maybe 30 feet from her. Shined her light on it. It was a group of deer, acting agitated. She panned her light around to see what was bugging them. Just upwind of them was a mountain lion, stalking them. She told me that when she shined her light on it, it gave her a look that said, Hey, I don't bother you before you eat a burrito. Leave me alone. She turned her light off, finished brushing her teeth, and crawled into her sleeping bag. I'm not sure what I would have done in that situation, but she lived to tell the story. I've been out camping in the National Forest in eastern Washington, random pull-out dispersed camping with only enough room for one vehicle and tent. Went to bed at around midnight and heard someone else stop and set up a tent in what sounded like the middle of the excuse for a road. A while later, they packed up and left. I figured the rocks were too much for them and went back to sleep. In the morning, I found they'd left a line of chicken bones all across my back bumper and a note cursing me, literally, for stealing their spot written on the back of a utility bill. I decided to be just as strange and mailed them the chicken bones all tied together in a sort of wreath. Later, I realized that bill could have been stolen mail. I really hope not, because oh my god, what would the people who got that box have thought? I've also had a spatula just go missing. I set it down on the edge of the fire pit, packed some stuff, went to get it and clean it, and it was just gone. I looked all over the campsite. I unpacked and went through everything. I looked under my seats. I checked the bushes. I went down to the water spigot, even though I was sure I hadn't been there yet that morning. I finally gave up and moved sites, the reason I'd been packing up. I came back for one last look, not for the spatula, just to make sure I hadn't left anything, and then took the side trail down to the sign-in area to leave a note I'd moved. Halfway down, I found the spatula with the large end sticking out of a ground squirrel hole, and the handle pulled in as far as possible. Laughing, I reached down and claimed my somewhat gnawed spatula. Pro tip, ground squirrels seem to really like bits of melted cheese and scrambled eggs. a U.S. Navy. About five years ago, we used to have this chief that was in charge of us on the boat. He lived and breathed the NATO Sea Sparrow Surface Missile System, and if you weren't a missile technician, you were inferior in his eyes. He was a hard ass that always kept us super late, especially to fix NSSMS, even if you weren't a missile technician. But despite all of that, he really did care for us. We were like his family and as much shit as he gave us, there was always something to laugh about with him or some crazy things he would make us do that would ultimately make us bond even more. There were often days where he would make us stay until well after 8 or 9 pm in port, and we would have to wait for him to fall asleep at his desk with a dip still packed in his lip so we could sneak out and go home. He was the embodiment of the stereotypical strict and unforgiving navy leader that comes to mind when you think about military service. He never seemed to care about going home. In fact I feel like he considered the ship more of a home than his house with a wife and three kids. One day out of the blue, Chief hung himself in the aft launcher room. Everyone on the ship was completely shocked by it because he never seemed like he was even struggling with anything and it was totally out of character. It was rough on all of us, but we had a job to do and we carried on with our drills and our workups for the coming deployment. We were working on the aft missile system a few months later one night out at sea. It was so dark, you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face, so we had the red lights on in the space so we could continue our work. As soon as we corrected the fault and got power back to it, we turned on the console to test it. Everything turned on like normal, all the tests ran fine, and it looked like we were done. But the launcher wasn't done proving it was ready to go. Not only did it turn on, but it started to move. We thought, okay, nothing crazy, there's probably something else down the line that's not getting good power, let's keep troubleshooting. Before we could get up to go do it, the computer system started to engage a target. 
This cannot be done on its own in the current configuration. There are so many fail safes in place to keep accidental engagements from happening. We tried to disengage the target, which I think was a commercial airliner flying over that Atlantic, on the console, but it would not let up. The launcher slewed over to the correct bearing to fire the missile. We slammed everything and turned it off and ran back aft to see what the F was causing anything to even start any of that process. Nothing. Everything was configured correctly, all of the voltage readings were fine, and nothing seemed to be mechanically or electrically wrong with the system. We turned it back on and everything was fine. Even to this day, weird things still happen back there. I was giving a new person a tour of the ship while I was on duty, and when I went back aft to show her the launcher room, my radio started making static noises. People have seen things fall off the walls and shelves when we weren't rocking, seen equipment turn on or off by itself. I'm pretty sure it's Chief. He always used to F with us, and he had a raging heart on for firing missiles. It's kind of poetic, really. Chief lived and died on the ship, and true to form, he still refuses to go home. There was a time when I thought that my life would be boring and mundane every day I'd get up go to work and then come home and take a nice shower before going to bed. Then one day that all changed right after my youngest daughter started high school my wife got a job at another state and we moved without much warning and my daughter also changed school so she wasn't around very often either. I remember how alone I felt until this day came when something called me from the darkness outside of town. It was about 1 AM when at first I thought it was nothing more than a raccoon rummaging through the trash cans outside the house. When suddenly from behind me I appeared this very chiseled humanoid creature standing well over 7 feet tall with matted black hair. I don't know what it was looking for but I can tell you that I almost had a heart attack when it turned around to face me with these glowing eyes. After what felt like an eternity of standing there in complete shock at the sight of this thing it looked to me for about 5 seconds before disappearing. I would consider this creature a chupacabra and based on what I've seen online and how this creature looked. After this I started drinking every night and didn't stop until years later when I finally moved back to my hometown. To this day I still think about this creature often wondering if he's still out there somewhere lurking in the darkness just waiting for another unsuspecting victim to pounce upon. I believe that would have been me had I been maybe in my full uniform. I was off duty at the time so who knows. It's signings like this that make me wonder if all my years as an officer in service have really gotten to me. It's possible that this experience has changed the way my brain feels and works. Maybe I've gathered hallucinogenic PTSD from everything I've gone through. Because since then, I've never seen anything quite like what I saw, but I can't help but feel that this was more than real and I didn't just have a vision. This was real, this was something that actually happened to me. I feel like if I had my radio or weapon on me, I would have taken a shot at this thing. Could it have been a demon? I don't know, I'm really not sure exactly what this was. In the middle of the Pacific Ocean on an icebreaker boat. We were steaming south and I had one of the night watches on the bridge, I was a QM. Anyone who has been on a ship at night knows almost all lights are out so your night vision can adjust, read, it is really dark on the bridge at night. I was leaning against the chart table, facing aft, talking to two other watch standers a few feet in front of and facing me. Suddenly I was looking at them as if it was noon on the sunniest day. I jumped past them and out onto the flying bridge to try to see what was happening. What appeared to be perfectly round, incredibly bright, yellowish orb was passing over us from east to west. It looked and felt like it was just barely above the ship and it was moving fast. There was no noise. I watched until it went beyond the horizon waiting for the explosion or crash when it hit the water. Nothing. The darkness that followed after its passing was incredible. From first seeing the light until it disappeared couldn't have been more than 10 seconds, horizon to horizon. 
At that time the phones on the bridge lit up with reports from all over the ship everybody described more or less the same sight. Some called it a meteor, some a flare, some a UFO. There were no surface contacts on radar, and this object wasn't either, but we initiated a search pattern in case it was a flare. I checked all pertinent notice to mariners looking for notice of rocket launches, live firing exercises or similar but found nothing that would explain it. This was in 1990 or so and as far as I know, none of us who were on the ship ever found out for sure what we saw. As is normal, not actually a cop myself but, I got this straight from the cop involved. So, these two veteran cops, let's call them Bob and Mike, respond to A911, that lack details, on a nicer block in a shit neighborhood of a large city. They get to the house and are met by this older woman who was clearly an immigrant from one of the Caribbean islands judging by her accent. She welcomes them in and politely tells them that she didn't make the call and alluded to having had previous issues with some of the local punk kids so they probably made the call as a prank. So Bob is not green by any standard and is pretty well educated for a cop. Super rational guy who has faced absolute nightmares with unflappable stoicism. But damned if there isn't something about that house that's telling him to run and not look back. And there's no reason for it. The house isn't a mansion but it's clean and well kept, the woman is annoyed about the prank call but entirely cordial with them, there's no weird sounds or smells that suggest something is amiss. Still, he can't shake this feeling of unbridled terror. They eventually finish taking the report and leave. After they get into the car, Mike looks at Bob and says damned, I'm so glad to be out of there. Place freaked me the F out. Now. This worries Bob more because Mike, in addition to being a veteran cop with time in the homicide department, was also some veteran of an elite military unit, whose name entirely escapes me at the moment, an all-around badass. That they both were independently freaked out was bizarre. Still, it's a big city and they have other stuff to worry about so they get back to work. But leaving that feeling unaddressed didn't sit well with Bob. When he was on his own and had nothing pending, he went back to that neighborhood and found the block captain, pro tip, if you want to know the details in a specific area, find the block captain. So he asks her hey, you know that islander lady on your block? The captain says oh, you mean the witch. And Bob is just like what? Remember those kids that were giving the homeowner a hard time? Apparently one of the local punks threw a rock at her window not too long ago before Bob and Mike visited. This shit, let's call him punk, basically acted like an asshole prick when the woman confronted him. Witnesses say she swore he would regret it. That very night, punk's parents rush him to the local hospital, which is actually a really phenomenal hospital despite the neighborhood. He's in massive pain for apparently no reason. The ER runs tests, he's in multiple organ failure and they have no idea why. None of their tests showed any reason why a previously healthy teenager was just dying in front of them. Nothing poisonous, no injuries, etc. The staff valiantly worked to stabilize him but nothing was working. At last, the parents went to the homeowner's place, throw themselves in front of her door, and beg her to spare their son. The homeowner supposedly looked at them with an oddly neutral face and said their son would be fine. Sure enough, for no reason that the hospital staff could fathom, Punk does a complete 180 during the night. All his organs start working again, he stabilizes, and is back to 100% come morning. There isn't even any permanent damage to his previously imperiled organs. Bob later confirmed at least Punk's mysterious illness and equally astounding recovery, Bob's contact was totally creeped out when he told her about the homeowner. So I'm not a cop but when I was a kid my mom had to call them on two occasions and here's why. When I was five we moved into a home built in 1840 and remodeled it. Lots of weird stuff would happen and while renovating the kitchen we even found human remains, yes they were reported and collected but we never heard back. Anyway, when I was about 13 I was at a friend's house for the night. 
My mom was in the living room below my bedroom and she heard what sounded like someone trashing my bedroom, smashing out my window and jumping onto the roof of the front porch. She naturally called the police and nothing was touched, no one could explain what happened. Another night I was asleep in my room and my dog started growling which woke me up. When I woke up it sounded like all the drawers downstairs were being thrown open and glass was breaking. I also heard boots walking. This was before cell phones and I just tried to keep my dog quiet. I gave him a bone and I army crawled to my brother's room down the hall. He was awake and heard it too. He got his baseball bat and went into my mom's room and she already had 911 on the line. The police arrived and heard the noises from outside the house. Once again, no signs of forced entry, nothing moved. There was also fresh snow on the ground and no abnormal steps outside. A lot happened in that house but these were the two times the law was involved and no one could explain anything. This is a story I heard from a guy I worked with in the Air Force while stationed at Osan Ab in South Korea in 2003. He said that when he was at his first duty station in Germany, about 10 years previous, he and another airman were rooming together in this small basement apartment off base. One night, he wakes in his tiny room to see a dark shadow person standing in front of his window. He jerks fully awake, and they're gone. The thing is that the bed is actually pushed against that window, so there isn't room for a person to stand. He assumes he was dreaming but is too rattled to go back to sleep, so after tossing and turning for hours he gives up and gets up. Same thing happens the next night. So he risks ridicule and asks his housemate if they'd been in his room the previous night around 3 a.m. The answer was no accompanied by ridicule. This happens to him every night for the next two weeks at 3 a.m. Eventually, it doesn't really shock him anymore. He sees the guy. Tries to focus on him. It disappears. He knows he won't sleep so he gets up around 3.15, makes coffee, watches TV until time for work. So one morning, usual routine. He's just sitting down on the couch with coffee in hand when a fireball shoots out of the stove that heats the apartment and ignites a dried up houseplant a couple feet away. He jumps up and puts the fire out by throwing the plant in the bathtub. And he was never bothered by the dark shadow again. I, then 25F, went solo camping with my Labrador. I set up my tent at the edge of the forest and everything was fine. In the middle of the night I heard footsteps around my tent and someone tried to open the zipper. Luckily I always secured the zipper with a suitcase lock. My dog, who has never been aggressive, completely freaked out and looked like he was ready to kill anyone if necessary. I think that was also the reason why the person then left. I couldn't sleep the rest of the night and at dawn I packed up and drove the three hours back home. Camping in the Wichita Mountains National Wildlife Refuge. Perhaps not as impressive as some of the stuff I've seen on this sub but for us it was a great camp. Hear the creaking of the cooler opening, figured it was some asshole from another campsite stealing our beer. Throw my headlamp on and I try to get out of my tent as fast as I can. F in raccoons had opened up the cooler and stolen our hot dogs. I followed the paw prints in the dirt back to an empty package of Hebrew nationals, and shelled out for Mir's burgers the next night. Every spring, my family spends the better part of a week camping at a nearby state park. We're all lifelong campers, so we're no strangers to the local wildlife and how to best fend them off. On our first night of this year's trip, we finished dinner and packed all the food away in the car. Not long after dark, we heard rustling in the tree line around our campground, followed of course by the appearance of a raccoon. We let him sniff around our picnic table, figuring if we scared him off, he'd come back, but if we let him look around and see there's no food left for him, he'd continue making his rounds to other campsites and leave us in peace. 
So he runs around our picnic table. Stands up with his front paws on the bench, getting a better sniff of the table up above. Runs off past our car towards the next campsite. Until we realized he didn't run past our car but rather to it. We hear the quite loud and unmistakable rustling of a chip bag and go to investigate. It turns out we left the car window open, and he climbed up in there and helped himself to a bag of potato chips. He scampered off as soon as we opened the door, but not before making quite the mess. There were chip crumbs all over the seat and floor, as well as muddy little paw prints on the seat and the hood of the car. The next night, we double and triple checked that the car was all closed up. The raccoon came by again, and definitely lingered at the car a bit longer than normal, but his efforts were wasted that time. We were camping out of a canoe in rural Missouri and had a run-in with a mountain lion. It followed us a couple miles down the river in the adjoining woods and we finally had to set up camp on the shore because it was getting dark middle of nowhere with no cell service and too far to float to the next resort. Our dog was a puppy at the time and could tell something was nearby and spent most of the time hiding. In the middle of the night something charged the side of the tent and took up two tent stakes. I have no idea how we didn't get eaten that night. Maybe the sound of us freaking out scared it away? I was solo camping in a state park campground on a spring weekday so there were not many people in the campground. I had just gotten in my tent to read a bit before bed when I heard this weird, almost simian howling. Up in the Pacific Northwest, my first thought was Sasquatch, even though I don't really believe, being alone in the woods will make you reconsider your beliefs pretty quick. The howling got closer, until it was right outside my tent and then a second set of howls started up in the distance. When I got to cell service in the morning I looked it up and found out it was most likely a barred owl, but it had me pretty freaked out in the dark alone. We went jungle slash mountain hiking once and camped near the summit, around 2000 Mossel. I walked away from our tents for a wee and realized I had chosen a small brook as my toilet spot. All of a sudden, on my right ear, I thought I really heard a whisper spoken in my native language say this is not good. I could swear I could feel the breath on my neck but there was absolutely no human around. I was also wide awake as my adrenaline was pumping as I was already too scared to stray away from camp. I still think a lot about that time and believe mountains are sacred. I was involved in the Boy Scouts growing up, and we went camping a few times every spring and summer. Before I aged out, we planned one more backpacking trip for a few days near a string of lakes in the mountains. We hiked there with no problem and saw many other groups along the way. A different troop of scouts settled at another lake nearby and we went about our day, setting up camp and finding things to do in the woods. After about a day, we got news that one of the boys from the other group had gone missing and hadn't returned to camp. To make matters worse, one of their scouts had broken their arm while out searching for him and needed to leave immediately, but they all couldn't leave since, you know, one of their other scouts was missing. Search and rescue was quickly called and by nightfall he still hadn't been found. The other scouts moved into our camp just to keep everyone together. Searchlights from the helicopters swept over us all night and would linger over our tents, totally illuminating us. Accompanying this were rangers with search dogs coming through the camp. They searched around our entire camp and we heard the dogs sniffing and brushing against our tents. In the morning, I had heard they questioned our leaders about the kid and if they knew anything. I just felt such a sense of dread the whole night, what if they didn't find him? They eventually found the kid after about a day, and their troop quickly packed up their things and left, but I can't help but just imagine how it would have felt being lost, it was always one of my biggest fears about the wilderness. Safe to say we stuck very close together for the rest of the trip. It's why I always use the buddy system or carry something with me to make noise with.
My husband and I went camping by ourselves after being married for several years. I planned it to be mildly romantic and took our dog with us so she could get out too. Everything was wonderful until the middle of the first night. Our dog is a lab and even though she looks like a soft, squishy animal her growl is menacing. In the pitch black, middle of the night dark, I wake up to her growling and immediately think something is outside our tent. I panic and quietly, but frantically wake my husband. There's something outside the tent. I whisper yell at my husband as we both rummage for flashlights and our glasses. We switch on the flashlight and look outside and nothing. Our dog is still growling and snarling so I traced her line of sight to a bug. Some little fly type bug that was stuck and couldn't get out. We get it out of the tent and she goes right back to sleep. Thank goodness she saved us from that one bug and took 10 years off our lives to do so. Southern Utah. One month camping slash hiking trip into the Escalante National Forest. Slow moving lights across the sky. Like alien spaceships. There was no sound. I was with a group of 12 friends. They approached slowly, over an hour and then were gone quickly. We were all laying in our sleeping bags and we were all concerned. After we returned from the trip we tried to find info on what they could have been. We never figure it out. Maybe military. Maybe aliens. On a small island, on the Mississippi River in Minnesota, on mushrooms and no it wasn't just a hallucination. My brother, myself, and two friends had taken mushrooms a couple hours before dark and were running around with flashlights. The entire interior of the island was covered in massive ferns that were about waist high and so many, so tightly packed in, that you couldn't even see the forest floor. Everyone was running around with flashlights and because you couldn't see the ground, every so often the bobbing flashlights would disappear when someone tripped on a log or hole. Someone yelled, how it feels like we are in Vietnam. We all sort of hooted and hollered and took back off running around, diving and dodging bullets as we all shared in that feeling and shared trip for a while. Not long after that, we heard a loud, and fast, bass beat that started growing even louder and louder, so loud you could feel it in your chest and as if whatever it was, was nearly right on top of us. We all stopped to catch our breath at the edge of the island, and somehow the noise grew even louder. When suddenly four, blacked out, military helicopters came flying down the river just a few feet above the water and flew right past us as all four of us just stood there like deer in headlights. Dumbfounded, and questioning whether what we were all seeing was even real. They passed right between our island and the next, so low and so close, we could see the pilots in the cockpit turn their heads and look at us, illuminated by the cockpit lights. It was really incredible and would have been an amazing sight even if we weren't tripping on mushrooms. It was incredible and quite the coincidence that we happened to be there, tripping on mushrooms that night when the nearby military base chose that night in that stretch of the river to conduct a helicopter exercise. So wild. My daughter and I had started our six-day trip into the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. First evening, we were set up, dinner finished, and we were just tidying up camp in the last light. Our site was on a corner of the shoreline where it turns from west to the north. The next closest sight was on the other side of the lake. I hear something coming through the woods, paralleling the shoreline from the west. Whatever it was, it was big, on the move and not caring about how much noise it was making as it plowed through the brush. It was also vocalizing. It was making a ha-ha sound and it was getting louder, closer. It was heading straight for our sight. My daughter and I realized that shit's about to get real, we each grab our bear spray and put our backs to the lake, and we start making a bunch of noise, yelling, clapping, banging paddles. Eventually, the thing in the forest gets close but never breaks out of the tree line. It starts to parallel us and then we hear it heading north and fading off into the distance. We never saw it. 
Next day we meet some rangers doing maintenance on a portage. We described our experience and they said it was likely a bull moose. The rut was going on at the time, mid-September, and the bulls are out looking for the lady moose. Plus they said that their eyesight isn't that great, so it could help explain why this thing was just plowing through branches and brush. Shorter story. Second night, different sight. I woke up, couldn't sleep so I just sat listening to the night sounds, loons and owls. Our tent is pretty close to the lake. I hear single footfalls in the water. Curse splash, curse splash. I wake up my daughter to tell her I think it's a bear, learned later, black bears aren't big waders when they can just be on the ground. I tell her we need to scare it out of the sight. She gives me a big nope and goes back to sleep. I get up, put my shoes on and go outside with my bear spray and headlamp. I walk down towards the shoreline but not all the way, we're on a cove and trees partially blocks my view of the entire shore. I yell get out of here bear. And then jump back into the tent. The footfalls stop and we didn't see any sign of tracks on the shoreline the next morning. Maybe it was another scary night moose. I lived in a haunted house. I was never afraid of supernatural, but it was a strange year living there. When we visited the house the first time I felt this strange unsettling feeling. I didn't want to live there but I was 16 at the time, and I had no vote in the house my mom would choose and it ended up being this one. Thankfully it was a rental so we could leave any time. There was an old blue trailer in the yard. The homeowner told us we could make any change to the house but we could not touch the trailer ever. We never even went near it, it was old and filthy and we didn't care for it. During the time that we lived there a series of stuff happened that we couldn't really explain at the time, but like I said I was never really afraid of supernatural. We would clean, and suddenly the floor would be covered in muddy dog feet. No dogs around. One night I want to change a lamp, standing on a ladder. The ladder tips over, I nearly hit my head on a sink. It was really close, but no reason for the ladder to tip over. In one year our house gets hit by lighting three times, going front to back breaking every single thing that was plugged into electricity. One of these times my brother was outside in the back, taking in some stuff he left outside, so it wouldn't get wet from the rain. Lighting hits and he gets ejected at least three meters through the air across the lawn hit a fence and falls on the ground. Miraculously he's shook but unharmed. One night I wake up having to use the bathroom. I get up and hear water running. So I walk into the bathroom, nothing. I wake my mom, tell her I hear water. She does too. We go downstairs, it's flooded, ankle high already. A pipe burst. Mind you, those pipes were replaced when we moved in as part of the agreement, so they were new. Another day I come home. We got a kitten, I find its head in the living room. Blood and nothing else. Looked like something ate it, it was horrible. For the longest time there was this girl who would walk in and out the house. We usually only caught a glimpse of her, mostly heard her giggle. This was a friendly neighborhood, so we figured it was one of the neighbor's kids, who was curious and playing games. We let her be. For a long time after that nothing out of the ordinary happened, but we wanted out of the house. We found a new place and while we were moving one of the neighbors comes to ask if we need help. He glances at the old trailer and says so that thing is still here huh? I told him we weren't allowed to touch it, asked him if he knew why. Since he was so interested in it I thought he might know. He told me the people who originally bought the ground to build the house lived in that trailer until the house was ready. They never finished it because the dad shot his six-year daughter and wife and then committed self-harm. Because of some formalities the case was never closed and the trailer was a crime scene, which made it illegal to take away or enter it. He continued, after those people died the house was bought by a dog breeder. He finished the house, and one night he wanted to change a lamp and his ladder tips over, hit his head on the sink and he died. To this day I am certain those two families and even the dogs were present in that house.
Not really a scary story but this story was told to me by one of the hardest slash toughest old school men I know. The man in question used to work as a taxi driver in Dublin Ireland and was doing his usual late shift on a winter's night. The story went something similar to this. This night the rain was pouring down as clubbers and party goers were getting ready to go home so he was pretty busy. He was getting ready to head home for the night but decided to do one more fare. As he arrives at the taxi rank, he picks up a male passenger at the top of the queue and asks him where he is going. A group of three females behind the male in the queue hear him say he's going in the same direction as them and would he mind if they shared the taxi with him. The male passenger accepts and all four people get into the taxi. While in the taxi the male passenger hears one of the girls talking about her ma'am. She's worried about her ma'am etc. The male passenger then says not to worry about anything and that her mother will be alright and the diagnosis will come back as negative. The girl got freaked out, and started to verbally attack the male. The male supposedly took it all in his stride and went on to elaborate that it was nice of the female to come home from America to look after her ma'am, that she'll land a good job soon and everything will be good in a year or so. The girl confirmed she came home from America to look after her ma'am and that she just went for an interview for a really good job. The male then went on talk to the other girls in the car telling them stuff about their personal lives that they hadn't disclosed, what to focus on and where they'll be in the future. When it came near the end of fare it was the taxi driver, one female and the male passenger in the car. According to the taxi driver the last girl was really into the male passenger and invited him in for coffee but he declined. It's just the taxi driver and the male passenger in the car now. The male passenger turned to the driver and said don't worry about your divorce everything will be okay and you'll still get to see you kids etc. This freaked the driver out as he was going through a messy divorce at the time. He said he almost got in a fight with the male passenger. The male passenger then confessed that his family warned him about saying stuff like that to strangers as it may get him into trouble. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.